Please welcome the wickedly talented one and only Adele Dazi. There's a mistake. Moonlight. Best picture. Recording. La la la. La la la. La la land. For best picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's technically a failed award contender. If, 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 it, if. He won. You count the not best picture. He, he won, he won director. Is yeah. Thing, so. I know, but it, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking up. It's the top two. Most explosive Oscar moments are Slapgate, which <laughs> the Will Smith one, which was just wild to watch play out. On like I was not watching that year because every every now and then I'm like fuck the Oscars and like I don't watch. And of course it was Slapgate and then Envelope Gate were the two years I didn't watch, which was I watched, amazing to watch live. I watched Envelope Gate. Mm-hmm. I did not watch the the slap. I just saw the Twitter oh, yeah, reaction. Remember, Everyone was like, "What just yeah, happened?" Everyone was like, and what, it was so funny. What was that? And people were like, "That was clearly a bit." Remember, people were like that for a minute, where I was like, "That, that was yeah. a bit." Like they must they just didn't. which is so fucking funny yeah. and, and telling because everyone's like, "Well, the jokes, the skits are usually really bad." So clearly, this is just an yeah, awkward just skit bad, happening. Bad humor, then, which might be a signifier to anyone with the brain to not try skits. But hey, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, hello, welcome back to the Failed Award Contenders. Number four is Travolta and Adina Menzel. <laughs> <laughs> there is a Conan bit. Did you see that after that Adele Dazim bit? No, I haven't seen uh, that one. He was still on there. It's not very funny, but the fact that it's not funny makes it even funnier. Mm-hmm. Where he's like, uh, yeah, there was a really embarrassing and really bad for John Travolta's career, but you know whose career was really good for? Please welcome to the stage upcoming singer Adele Dazim. <laughs> And then she gets her name wrong, and it's like, it's not the best performance ever, um, and it's really awkward, and then whatever, she gets her name wrong too, and he's like, you know, that wasn't really good for your career, but you know whose career was really good for her? <laughs> and he does it like three times. Wow. That's <laughs> I miss that guy on the yeah. air. That he's was... got a podcast that's actually pretty funny. Yeah, I, I love listening to it, and I mean, him and Craig Ferguson were kind of like my era of late yeah, night guys. Yeah, same. And uh, we I guess Craig will, we will, might be coming back. Uh, you know what? We will uh, we will talk about the late night landscape possibly later in this retrospective. Oh yeah. There's no way anyone's going to be able to guess that movie though. <laughs> it is not the king of comedy. I'll say that. Mm. Which is no. We're going to talk about the Joker again. <laughs> yes, Joker again. That's the yeah that's the other thing. I forgot <laughs> so... Sean Penn said something just blatantly racist after Henry Two won uh, best director. Do you remember this? I I remember that. I don't remember what it was. He said, who gave this son of a bitch his green card? Oh. Like, I, he, was, he was trying to be funny, I think. But, yeah, like, but it's Sean Penn. Yeah. It's like, that dude's never said a joke in his life. This one Why try says, now? Seth MacFarlane's crass song. I don't remember what his song was, but I just remember that whole thing kind of being a disaster. His whole hosting. I don't remember, but it's so funny because, like, Seth MacFarlane, for all, like, his, like, ups and downs, like, everyone knows that he's, like, a really charming guy. Yeah. Kind of. Like, people seem, people seem to like him at the very mm-hmm. least. He, he charms the people in the industry. There you go. Yeah. I, I don't know him. Maybe he's not charming in person. But uh, people, like, are won over by him in the industry very well. I mean, he had a fucking directing career yeah. the last decade. I think uh, I just think of the uh, Patrice O'Neill when he was roasting. I think it was Charlie Sheen, but Seth MacFarlane was there. And he was roasting and he was being like, it's like Seth's jealous of his own creation. Like, he wants to be bigger than the cartoons, but he's not bigger than the cartoons. <laughs> and he was like, and you need to send someone to slap him and slap him twice. Slap him once to say, don't forget what people love you. And slap him again to just to get him to admit he's gay. <laughs> he's like, no straight man <laughs> writes that many show tunes. That's a fact. Aww. Rest in peace, Patrice. You'd be saying some insane shit on Twitter right now if you were still alive. Oh my god, yeah. Oh, do you remember Adrian Brody kissing Halle Berry? Uh, I do. That was strange. Which is strange. Adrian Brody, weird guy. Yeah. yeah. Michael Moore now, got booed uh, off stage. Remember this? I don't remember that one. He went on like a screed against uh, Bush in the Iraq War. 
Oh, so that's he, why they booed so, him off. So, okay. Yeah, he was, you know, he was he was on the right side of history, but he was Michael Moore. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that's the thing. It's like, yeah, right side of history, still Michael Moore. Um <laughs> that's like his whole thing. Uh oh, we should say we're here to talk about uh Nicholas Winding Refn's drive. Oh yes. Yes. I'm still looking at Oscar fumbles. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I mean, the biggest Oscar fumble. Love or hate this movie, and we'll get into all that. Um, everyone walked away going, well, Albert Brooks is going to be the best supporting yeah. actor win. It, not only like were they like, he's going to get nominated. Like, he is guaranteed to win. Like, this is a, it's, it's a guarantee he is going to win this year. And then he wasn't even nominated. Like, that's wild to think about when you look back. It's criminal. Now, can you tell me who it was won? Criminal. Uh, actually, yes, but only because I googled it as I was saying it. Uh, Christopher Plummer for some movie called Beginners. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, he's he's the grandfather who dies in it. Oh, okay. Spoilers. Well, I mean, hey, uh, fucking God bless Christopher Plummer's acting well, Christopher career. Terrific amazing. actor. Um, but yeah. also like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, like what? Sorry, what movie? <laughs> That's the, also the Jonah Hill in Moneyball year. Uh, Nick Nolte in Warrior? The fuck? Oh, he's good in that. I just can't even believe that got nominated for anything. Uh, Kenneth Branagh when he played Laurence Olivier in a movie no one remembers. Yeah, I didn't remember that one either. Um, yeah, thank God they just stopped making Marilyn Monroe pictures. I mean... They've tried too many fucking times. Um, and then, oh, this is, here's where, here's where he totally could have at least fit in. Max von Sydow had no reason being nominated for Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. That movie had no business oh being nominated for a single Oscar that year. No, that's an embarrassing ass movie. Yeah, that's a bad We will movie. not be talking about that. No. Because that's Even though it is explicitly movie. about one of our favorite topics, 9-11. Yes. Maybe, so maybe, maybe. No, we're but never like, covering that movie. Because it's yeah. bad. Like, that's the, it's just not even interesting. Like. That's the dude who ended up doing Doolittle, right? Is it? He's not credited. As, but, like, Doolittle also has, like, a t- torturous production. Like. Yeah, th- I mean, there are, like, five people. It's the guy who did uh, Billy Elliot and The Hours and The Reader. Yeah, Stephen Daldry. Yeah. And then. I remember liking The Reader. I haven't seen it since, like, it came out, though. I haven't either. I saw The Hours like a year after it came out. Mm. I don't remember why the fuck I watched The Hours. <laughs> Sometimes you just <laughs> but watch I've seen movies, that movie. man. Like, when you're younger, you just don't give a fuck. You just put a movie on. Yeah. No, I, I think like... I think it was like a... Like, some family was watching it one time and I was just there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But, um, I, anyways, he, he almost did... Uh, this guy, Stephen Daldry, almost did the Kenobi movie. There's gonna be a Kenobi movie. <laughs> yeah, Obi Wan Kenobi. It was it was like that one of those like we're gonna do a movie and then when Solo bombed, it's like actually it's a show now. Yeah, and then everyone who watched the show tells me like, yeah, it, was, it should have been a movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> which is like the streaming thing yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, if you have any movie ideas you're worried about turning into streaming properties, um, give it give it a couple. That years. is a sec- that got a that second one. season, right? No, it's a one and done. I thought they talked about doing more. Um, I I think everything that like could possibly have led up to them doing more mm-hmm. was the critical response and the fact that like oh yeah people don't actually really care that much about this era mm-hmm. of uh, Obi Wan's story because it's not important. I could have sworn <laughs> I heard it was getting another season. They talked about it. It's gone quiet. I, I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, I really don't. What's the I, one that's come? What are the ones yeah. that are coming out? There's like Ahsoka. Ahsoka, uh, which apparently uh, Dave Filoni's not directing any of. He's just show running, which might make it really good. No no disrespect to him. Uh, that might make it work. Um, Mandalorian Season 3 is starting around the time this episode is going to drop, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll check out the Bryce Dallas Howard and Rick Famuyiwa episodes. Mm-hmm. And or Season 2, which will be the last one. And is it, They say already it's going to be the last one? Yeah, they said it's going to be the last one because, I mean, along with COVID, the production rewrites and the reshooting after Tony Gilroy finally came on board to run the whole thing, 
uh, it it took five years to get that season released. So they were like, we can't do this forever. Mm-hmm. Let's just wrap it up with one more. We'll condense our five season plan into a two season plan. <sighs> Whatever. I, I, I'm not that heartbroken, but I I am. But also, but like, I, I don't like yeah. anything that's going on with Star Wars right now, frankly. No. Um, what's I think that's all the shows. I'm pro- Oh no, there's something called Skeleton Crew coming out. Oh, that'll be fun. That? Uh, <laughs> well, do you, do you know that one? No, but why? What? What do I care? Okay, can I explain it? Sure. All right. So, Skeleton Crew is the John Watts created show that he pitched to John Favreau, I believe, on Far From Home, on on the set for Far From Home. Um, not No Way Home, Far From Home, the one before that. And then uh, after No Way Home, they developed it because that those movies don't take that long to make, and um, it's gonna be like Stranger Things in space. Okay. Oh, kind of oh, like cool. You know pitch. what? You, you should have pitched that a little better. You should have handed me a gun before you started talking, <laughs> so I could blow my fucking brains out. And but, the, here, here's the next, the, the last show that they have lined up. It's called The Acolyte. The Acolyte. Yeah, which is yeah. like gonna be some Palpatine shit, but. Uh, I, I was fucking saying that too. <laughs> Apparently it takes place before Palpatine. Like, yeah, but they'll find, they'll find some fucking way. Maybe, maybe, but created by Leslie Headland, mm-hmm. um, the, the Russian doll showrunner and creator, uh, someone who has said that they like Star Wars, but they're not another diehard fan of it. Mm-hmm. They wanted to explore like other stuff specifically not related to the main saga stuff, uh, which, you know, could just be buzzword shit. Who knows? But it's the type of buzzwords that we don't really hear of anymore of. Yeah. Everyone's like, well, I love the original trilogy. And it's like, everything stems from that. So this one could be something. Yeah. Oh, that's all I'm saying. This this is the one I'm looking forward to. What was Andor. the buzz going around recently about the fucking movies? Uh, oh, I, I saw you hated this. Uh, yeah, but... I was infuriated, but I didn't understand. Nothing happened, so I didn't understand what anyone was talking about. Uh, the, the streets are saying that... The sequel trilogy will have a new sequel trilogy. The first movie will be written uh, by Damon Lindelof, and it's going to bring back Rey and be about the generation she's training now yeah. as Jedi. Yeah. yeah. Which is just rumor. It could be fucking nothing. It could be complete opposite of I that. Hope it's, you know? I hope it's nothing. But Okay. I mean... What? Nicholas Winding Refn Star Shut Wars? the fuck up for a second. Let me be angry. <laughs> <laughs> You wanted you wanted to get back on topic, but I'm just so angry by all those words. <laughs> like I just I just uh, I don't know. I, I gotta I just gotta I just gotta break it up with Star Wars. All right. As much as I like it, like I'm just it's they want to do something different than what I want from it, and. I guess that's fine at the end of the day, but, um, yeah, it's just, I'm ready to move past a lot of what, it's just going to be the same shit again. Eh. What could he possibly bring to the table? Well, I don't know. Because he's never, I mean, Lost is only my favorite show ever. Yeah, well, that's supposed to be the good thing he's did, and I've never been able to watch more than five episodes. Uh, did you ever see The Leftovers? Um, I started it, and then I was like, this is bad. And I started. All right, the, the first season is miserable. Mm. I, not in terms of quality. I think it's actually good. It's just, like, miserable. Mm. And then season two and three happen, and you're like, oh, no, this is kind of the shit. You know what? That was what was weird about Lost. I found Lost to be miserable, too. Like, again, mm. I only watched, like, a handful of episodes, but I kind of can't get over that they're stuck on an island. <laughs> Like, that's it's a, like a normal premise. Yeah, but like that's a bad situation to be in, man. Oh no, it is. It and, is. And like, there's nothing fun about it. <laughs> and then All also, right, but to be fair, the fun comes in like waves. It's it's it really is like. I'm just the saying, first like, season... it's it's one of those things where like it's such a problem hanging over the show that like it's hard for me to get into it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm sure it may. I'm sure it picks up. I should have given it more of a chance. Uh, but the leftovers was also yeah, that was kind of miserable. And I'm not into what it was laying down, I guess. Right. And then he's never written a good movie, so. Uh, well, Prometheus. Oh, I forgot. He wrote Cowboys and Aliens. Oh. 
Everyone just want to pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> no, no. Let, let me let's take a look at his resume, and then we'll get back to talking about wrote, drive. Ca- I'll tell you exactly what about it. Cowboys and Aliens, Prometheus, World War Z, Star Trek Into Darkness, Tomorrowland, and The Hunt. All right. Well, Tomorrowland and World War Z. Well, no, Star Trek Into Darkness and World War Z. He wrote on. Yeah, but those movies they had, like had like a bunch. Of yeah, they had a bunch of problems, especially World War Z. It. Fucking Drew Goddard wrote on World War Z. Yeah. What was he just seemed to have like a torturous production in general? Like, I mean, they reshot like the last like hour. Yeah, of and movie. another movie where like they were like a day away from starting the sequel and just stopped it. Like, yeah, which because like, everyone was like, "You want to bring David Fincher on to do it?" Mm-hmm. And Brad Pitt's like, "Yeah." And then David Fincher's like, "I'm gonna fuck up everyone's lives, and we're gonna make the greatest movie ever made." Yeah, what's Fincher's okay. weird man? He, he's got hang-ups. Fincher's so he's weird. Got hang-ups. Um, yeah. But he made Mank. Yeah, we'll never talk about that though. Um, <laughs> and Star Trek Into Darkness is like that's got the. I was thinking about Robert Orsi recently, probably because of the Lindelof thing. And that is the like nine eleven was an inside job movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, which what did Lindelof bring to the table there? Do we know? Uh... What, what ideas were his? I actually have no idea for that, that one. That would, I would need to know that before I can really judge it. You know why else, too? Because, like, Lind- like I, I know you hate him, but, like, Lindelof, I, I love him because of a lot of his, like, like big philosophical questioning character stuff. And Star Trek in the Darkness doesn't have any of that. Mm-hmm. So I'm so curious yeah. about what he could have contributed to that movie. Well, I, I don't like his philosophical stuff. And I also don't think he's a great structure guy. So, like, I get nothing from him, really. Uh, That's interesting, because I, I actually think he's, like, once he has, like, his end point, he's like, all right, if I'm going to that, here's how I can get there. I know you weren't crazy about it. I loved Watchmen. <laughs> um, Wait, but are you bringing I, up that when he has an end point that he knows that he's going for, like, he builds, like, are you bringing that up as a good thing? As a good thing. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. I think sometimes the only idea he has is his end point, and then he builds a movie to that that isn't interesting. I think he's okay. Movie, movie wise, I shows are different. It's, but it's a again, mess. like it's I a mess. His stuff, I just haven't connected with his shows. Okay, and yeah. I don't like the ideas he's playing with either. Um, and but also, like, I just don't know what the fuck. But like, I'm thinking Tomorrowland might be the biggest example of that, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Like of just like that's a movie that he clearly wants to make the point he's making at the end, and then he built a movie leading towards that that is boring as shit, and just doesn't work. I still haven't seen it. It's su- it was such a bummer, dude. I was like so there for it because it was you know it's Brad Bird, and it was one of these. It was so fucked up where it's one of these movies where it just looked like it was gonna bomb, right? Like you know, yeah, sometimes you see yeah. those movies and you're like, it's gonna bomb. I have to go there to see it. And it's a movie about how no one wants to see a movie like Tomorrowland anymore. And imagine paying money <laughs> to support a movie you know people aren't going to see. <laughs> Only to sit there and get scolded about how no one wants to see a movie like this. And it's like, dude, I paid money. <laughs> like, I'm here. <laughs> they gave me a how button. Is the action, at least, though? Is the action at least good? Because, um, like, again, it's fucking Brad Bird. Hit and miss, hit and miss. Okay. But there's also like just not like the like the set pieces aren't that good and like it's got a terrible mystery plot structure to it mm. of like we got to go to the thing to put the thing on the thing to get to the thing which is like that's why like I worry that's what he brought to Into Darkness cuz Into Darkness has an insane mystery plot to it you know like where it's like there are, yeah. the people are in the missiles remember that like yeah yeah and yeah. I'm hoping that wasn't Lindelof like you know what? That one might be because it's like, oh, they're weaponizing people and stuff like that. Like, there's there is an idea there. I don't think that's what that movie needed. Yeah. That movie needed to let people talk for a second and like explore conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say, I think the action in in the darkness is still like quality, Abrams but who cares? Because the movie's fine bad. action, except in Rise of Skywalker for some reason. No, no, no. I, I think it's good there too, but it's like it's ninety percent of the movie. Mm-hmm. That should not be your last, yeah. like, that should not be the finale of your, your franchise. Yeah. That's it's the opposite of what it should be. You need, like, three max, you know? Mm-hmm. 
At the very least, at least make them character focused. But I just think every other scene in that movie is someone running to somewhere else. With someone like Lindelof, though, it's like I don't know, man. It's I talked about Jordan Peele, where Jordan Peele knows the exact moment to reveal what's going on. You know, like he knows the exact moment to pull the rug out from under the audience. And the movies, and like the great thing about Jordan Peele is like they never lose steam once that happens, right? Yeah. And there's something uh, about Lindelof. Yeah. How where, like, fucking good was no. Yeah, but like with Lindelof, there's something about once you know what's going on, it becomes less interesting. And then the road to there is uninteresting on any sort of rewatch. Well, hey, maybe Lindelof is just a TV guy, and like maybe he should be doing maybe, Star Wars TV. Well, no, you know? hey, if 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 he's a TV guy, which I'm not sure he is, but I can't really judge. Um, maybe he should write a trilogy of Star Wars movies. You know, like if he mm-hmm. oversaw the trilogy, maybe that would work. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, I have such mixed feelings on that. Well, we'll see. Bill because, Bird almost no, I... did uh, Star Wars uh, 7. He was one of the guys that yeah, he, he wanted to do which, Tomorrowland. Yeah, which we talked about on our Force Awakens retrospective yeah. back in the day. I That that memory is already dead. Like, I, <laughs> I, I just don't remember anything we said on the podcast over three years ago. Yeah, that's fine. I barely remember what I had for breakfast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I sure hope I this Trump guy doesn't get elected. Conversation. I bet you we said that a few times. <laughs> that was already 2017. Mm-hmm. He was already president. Hey. That's fucking crazy. All that's fucking crazy. Yeah. I think we're finally getting to a point as a country where we'd be like, that was insane. Like, yeah. even the people that, like, were on board initially are like, no, that was insane. Like, yeah. Does give me hope for the next election, does, we'll which is see. a foolish thing to have. Yeah, it's always fool. It's foolish to have hope. Um, what is it? That was a uh, norm where he's like, "I don't give a fuck what Obama says. Hope is never good." <laughs> Try it. <laughs> oh, I thought you were gonna say the really inspirational quote from Lord of the Rings, where he's like, "There never was much hope, yeah. just a fool's yeah. hope." And no, no, you're like, "No, I mean, no, the norm." <laughs> but uh, but hey, Norm should have been a wizard. God damn it. Anyway, uh, he could have been Gandalf. He could have. Oh, Norm could have been Albert Brooks's character in Drive. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey Driver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I heard you got some money from me, buddy. <laughs> um, but, yeah, let's get back to Drive now that I've rambled. Yeah, yeah. We only spoke for, like, over two hours prior to recording and yeah. then spent the first hour of this We somehow didn't get non-drive. the Star Wars talk out before we started recording. No, we had... We had here's the fucking thing. When you told me, you were like, I'm going to talk about the DC stuff. I was like, okay, that makes sense because Drive is a superhero movie. Yeah, yeah. We, that is like the, the that's one of the, that like the, the, the things about the movie. Take. That is yeah. the take everyone knows about this movie. Yes, which which I think is, is a brilliant take but and a brilliant part read of, of the movie. Like, it's that point has been made so much. I don't know if I have much to add to it, which is partly why I was like, I'll, I'll, let me get this superhero talk out of the way with Diego so I don't bring it up on the episode. Like that's part of the like meta game I have to play when I do these is I have to bring up the shit that just isn't that interesting before we record. And then I still manage to get us back to Star Wars. That's on me. But and none of these people have ever been in a Star Wars in this movie. You're right. No, it's Oscar <laughs> Isaac. <laughs> Oscar Isaac with yeah. Poe Dameron. This is and this is uh, one of the weird uh, reasons why Poe Dameron doesn't die in Force Awakens. Do you know this? Drive specifically? Yes. Well, it's one. Why? All right. So Oscar Isaac's that character was supposed to die, right? Poe Dameron was yeah. initially going to die. Oscar Isaac's had done Drive, and I think like one or two other movies that I can't think of where he dies early on in it, right? That he kind of plays that role. Yeah. And he goes to Abrams and is like, look, I would love to do this, but I've just done, I, like, I keep dying in movies. <laughs> like, I don't want to die again. And so instead, uh, so then Abrams like, oh, cool. We'll just bring you back without really any explanation. <laughs> yeah. Which is uh, maybe his hang up as a storyteller it's like yeah we could just do that and it's no, like wait 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 wait, wait. <laughs> that is one of the better things in that movie in my opinion no no no. i mean i still love force awakens still hope abrams comes back as a director for other stuff 
Um, I'm glad Poe Dameron's in there. Uh, he gets incredible work in The Last Jedi, mm. and he's tons of fun in Force Awakens. It's the best example of that work. I forgot Oscar Isaacs was in that movie that is basically a, uh, a movie arguing in favor of charter schools. Wait, what? Do you remember this movie? What? What? Won't no. Back Down. What? It was Won't the Maggie down. Gyllenhaal, Viola Davis movie. I I don't think I've heard of this. No one really remembers it. It was like a big deal, but it was basically just propaganda for like charter schools. No, oh boy. And like it was oh, one of the... been in propaganda before. It's fine. Yeah, but it's it's one of those where like I think it was never designed to actually be seen by people. Ah. Uh, and it's like an anti-union movie, specifically the teachers' union, because I don't think people remember after the financial crash. For whatever reason, we blame teachers. And, like, we came really, like, the country came down really hard on teachers' unions. Uh, I do remember that because my mother is a teacher. What the fuck and... was that about? Why did we go after teachers? Uh, because this country needs people to blame, and the but poor like, working class people are there always was, like, the ones literally, get the brunt of it. There wasn't even, like, a ch- tangential connection, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. That was just one of those, like, Republicans are like, we gotta go after someone. Yeah. Like, and again, they're going after teachers differently now. Yeah, well, now course. they're just going after they're going after the, the curriculum very specifically right now. Yeah, because the they curriculum's just, too woke, and well, it's like no, no, we, charter we, we did schools. <laughs> what we learn because I remember I remember waiting for Superman. Do you remember waiting for Superman? I never saw it, but I know the title. But that's the one where it's, it's a pro charter school documentary, right? Mm. And it is kind of about like our education system's broke. For some people, charter schools are the only way out. And what we learned was charter schools were a way to basically get around teachers' unions and a lot of the uh, First Amendment protection that schools have. Like, specifically, Mm. like, you can't have prayer in schools. Like, right now, there's a lot of cases that the Supreme Court's probably going to fuck us on where uh, they might be able to legally bring prayer back to charter schools. And you can't do it in public schools now, right? Because that's, you know, against the First Amendment. But charter schools might operate by different rules. And that's what charter schools were a Trojan horse to get a lot of those really conservative ideas back into schools. Um, Not saying that's the only reason charter schools exist, but that's what they ended up being used for. And now they've kind of pivoted to this like parents' rights movement. And now you see a lot of videos on YouTube where it's like, Parent slam school board, right? Like those are mm-hmm. really popular on YouTube, and it's all propaganda that's trying to just get uh, the First Amendment out of public schools. And the First Amendment wasn't even that strong in public schools to begin with, but um, hey, things uh, yeah. things are weird. Things were weird back then. Uh, they're weird now. <laughs> yeah, but but. Oh, uh, things were so weird that film district distribution was still a thing. Yeah. Um, this is probably the... F- what other film district movies can you name? Evil Dead. Evil Dead. Oh, I remember yeah, that they one. they did do Evil Dead. Um, Looper. Oh, shit. That's yeah. right. They have this weird run where they do like... They did... I think we talked about this. They did Drive, Looper, the Insidious movies... Oh, here's what did them in. Safety not guaranteed. Um, did they? It didn't. It didn't. I'm just talking shit. But they just distributed that, right? Yeah. These yeah. are movies. Co-distribution. They, these are movies they actually put money behind. They put money behind Drive, Looper, the Insidious movies, Soul Surfer, which was like a weird, like Middle America hit. Do you remember that? I remember. No, I don't remember. It's that. A, it's what? based on. It's like one of those true, like inspirational stories where, like. A surfer lost her arm to like a shark attack, but through the power of faith, she like kept surfing. Oh, okay. It's one of those. Uh, that don't be afraid of the dark movie that Guillermo del Toro produced, um, which is very okay. Um, I see that. And then they do Pompeii, Red Dawn, and Lockout, which are like three like insanely cursed movies. In terms of like their path to distribution, hmm. do you remember like no, Pompeii was no. kind of more just a like what like why are we doing a Pompeii movie? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the that's the Paul W. S. Anderson one. Yes, it's the the really good final moments. Mm-hmm. But then Red Dawn was the Red Dawn remake, which like why remake Red Dawn? 
Yeah, um, which is awful. It sat. Red Dawn's a good movie. Um, but oh the, the remake God. sat on a shelf for like a year, and then it was one of those where like China was the villain in it, <laughs> and they reshot it to be North Korea. <laughs> Yeah, like, which is the same thing that happened to Homeland, the video game. Remember that? No, what? So there was, you remember the video game Homeland? I I think you talked to me about it before. It was THQ's attempt to get, like, some of that Call of Duty Black Ops money. Of course, of course. They make a first-person shooter, call it Homeland. They get John Milius to write it. John Milius, the writer-director of Red Dawn, wrote Homeland, the video game. Um. It, the plot was, is it Homeland? I might have gotten the title wrong. Wait, wait, Home Front. Home Front. Is it Home Front? That's what it is, yeah. Okay. Uh, home Front. It, it was going to be China where the villains, last minute they change it to North Korea, and then the game bombs. And it basically was one of the things that sank THQ. Ah. Uh... And so, like, Red Dawn had a similar thing where it sat on a shelf, they had to spend all this money for reshoots, and it comes out and it still bombs. And then Lockout is the uh, movie that John Carpenter sued <laughs> and won. Yes, and won and won. So, and then Fucking they're just Luke gone. Like, and like, like that's like over. Yeah, like all that's over like a two year period, and then suddenly all those like the studios is gone. Oh man, that's too bad. They they were a pretty good developer. Well, yeah. It's, here's the thing: the movies they did that were well are like these really low budget genre films, right? And mm-hmm. suddenly, out of nowhere, they're like, "Let's do big budget action movies," and all of them bombed. Like, that's a terrible pivot. Yeah. Who thought Pompeii would be a good idea? Paul W. S. Anderson. Yeah, but Paul W. S. Anderson's an idiot. So, <laughs> like, who listens to him? I liked Monster Hunter. I know you did. You friggin' commie. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't crazy about his last Resident Evil movie, though. Yeah, not crazy about any of them, frankly. I don't know. There, there's some good ones in there. Yeah, no. on them, but yeah, the one ones. he didn't direct. I do like that one a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that is the, the really Extinction. good one, and it's bad. Yeah. it's the one he didn't do. Yeah, it's Extinction, and then uh, the first one, and then Retribution. Mm-hmm. And those three are my favorites. Yeah. And then Afterlife is pretty good too. No. Yeah, yeah, it's no. uh, it's about Hollywood. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Don't don't you dare say that to me ever again. <laughs> don't you even come you come into my house and you say this shit. You're gonna say Paul Thomas Anderson made a movie about Hollywood. Yeah. Guy fucking it's, guy getting like stunt people fucked up on his movies. He made a movie yeah, about Hollywood. You're, you're right. You know, you're you're totally you're right. Gonna, yes. You're gonna, you're gonna make that argument to my face. What do you do do you wanna go to hell when you die? <laughs> Are you like trying? <laughs> All right, let's talk about Drive. Does anyone out there own a copy of Homefront? I want to know this. Can you get it on Steam? Um, I it probably not. There's also a movie called Homefront. Oh yes, you can get it on Steam. Okay. It's rated six out of ten by the community. The online multiplayer function of the game is now defunct. <laughs> Due to the sale why. and closure of THQ in 2013. Although it is still playable on the PC if you know how to like mod shit, probably. Oh, good. Hey, the writer of Drive also wrote The Snowman. That makes sense, honestly. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the the movie adaptation of The Snowman. I tried, uh, and he also I tried had, to uh, get two back other to the Wikipedia page for Drive, and I ended up writing Thrive. <laughs> why i don't know my brain's not working right now <laughs> uh well um all right when did you first watch drive in theaters when it was released same do you all right uh this it's 2000 i'm trying to put myself back into the mindset so it's 2011 i'm still in high school kind of like this is like i fucked up like i'm half attending high school era um i YouTube has just started, like, really going in on putting ads before videos, right? Oh, God, that's right. This is that era. I put on a YouTube video, and a trailer for a movie starts playing, and I'm waiting for those five seconds to go by so I can skip it. But then I keep watching it for some reason. (laughs) And I'm like, and then it's like, drive, 
out this Friday. And like, I immediately called my father and I was like, Hey, there's a movie coming out called drive. You want to go see it? And he's like, sure. That was it. That's all it took for me to go see it. Like, I don't know why it grabbed me though. Like it did kind of have a vibe of like, at the time I could be wrong, but at the time it did have the vibe of there hasn't been a movie like this in a little bit. I should check this out. Right. Mm-hmm. like it felt like a type of crime movie that just like from the trailer you're like i haven't seen this in a while let's go watch it and i i could be wrong maybe there were other stuff released that year i don't think you're wrong mm-hmm. i i think um this is one of the first movies that's like oh it's like kind of a throwback to the 80s it has like a synth score look at the title font it's yeah. very like retro um it's the like one last job type movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also very similar to like Thief. Yeah, you know, and the driver. And the main comparisons are pretty like obvious. Um, and but I'm looking at the landscape of movies in 2011, and it's just like it is kind of like one of these things is not like the other in terms of uh, movies being released because mm-hmm. it's like this is the Captain America Thor year um so it's like this is marvel being like here's our shared universe we got deathly hollows part two so that's like it's finally ending <laughs> our long <laughs> national crisis is over no uh, no it, it's good until like the very end that movie is so terrible don't you fucking say a word god damn it <laughs> like x-men first class which is a movie hey. where everyone was like hey x-men are back and then like you watch it and it's like well about 75 percent of that movie was good yeah, hey, I think that 75% holds up. <laughs> sure. I don't think I would ever rewatch it, though. You probably don't need to. Yeah. I I still enjoyed most of it. Um, Rango, there's a good movie. Oh, yeah, um, fantastic. Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which everyone was like, this looks atrocious. And it <laughs> comes out, people are like, actually, that was pretty good. Yeah. Like, uh, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, speaking of... Uh, oh, no. Did, yeah, Brad Bird did Ghost yeah, Protocol. That's yeah. still my favorite one. Yeah. That's a that, that's a pretty good one. The, like Ghost Protocol is like a weird thing. They just is clearly had a title and then they made a movie around it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, but like it, that movie is in my I, I, a platonic ideal yeah. of what the franchise should be. On Stranger Tides, the fourth Pirates movie, which uh, which is not no good. one likes. Yeah, not no good. one likes that one. A uh, Scream Four, which is a masterpiece. Which is, yeah, a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, but also was another one where it was like. I, I think I talked about it on the screen episode where, like, the first person in that movie gets stabbed, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what these movies used to be. Yeah. Like, you, like there hadn't been a slasher movie in a while. Yeah. Um, Super And if, if they were out there, like, it's worth saying, like, they, they weren't that. They yeah, weren't, they like... were, like, Saw. They were, like, torture porn adjacent. Like... Yeah. They were, like, oh, this guy, like, every kill was, like, psychotic. Um, Super 8, which is, like, oh, J.J. Abrams might actually have a career where he does original ideas. And then he never does that again. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, that's crazy. It's been over a decade since he's done an original movie. Um, Hangover, oh, t- Hangover Two, which is a bunch, which is a moment like that's kind of like the audience came out of their Hangover for the first Hangover. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I, I've talked about it before, but I saw Hangover Two the morning after grad night. No yeah. one slept. And we just like we we stroll into the theater. Everyone's tired and angry. Uh, there wasn't like it, it wasn't like high school drama. Even it was just yeah. like you know you're fucking up doing stuff all night. And we go to the theater we're like that was bad. Mm-hmm. But maybe we're just in a bad mood. Let's go back to watch it another time. And watch it again. We're like no, that was fucking bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like <laughs> it's just a bad movie. You know, I gotta say this is not a good year for movies. Honestly, like yeah, like, there's I, some I great stuff here. Shit. There's you know there's Drive. There's Melancholia. There's contagion. Attack the Block. Yeah. Uh, the... I, I used to shit on like 2009. I was like, man, that was a rough one. Mm-hmm. 2011 wasn't great yeah. either. Here's, I think 2011 might have the leg up because there's a there actually are a lot of good movies, but they're surrounded by some pretty terrible movies. Yeah, there, there's some dog shit. Like Moneyball's in there, which is great, but then you got like Cars 2, which is like, <sighs> that's like the death of like Pixar as like an untouchable studio, basically. Yeah, that's the one even like Disney adults are like, Oh yeah. no! No one even acknowledges that one. Yeah. Um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which we talked about. Yep. Oh, that was the Terrific. Green Lantern year. Whew. Um, horrible bosses, which like made a shit ton of money. Oh yeah. Um, 
the other Puss in Boots movie. Which is, I think it's solid. Yeah. I, I won't really defend it, but like, I think it's solid. I remember this was one of those movies where like, I had to go out of my way to see the good stuff. Like all the good stuff was released in like one theater in the city I was living. And I would like mm-hmm. have to go out of my way to see it. Whereas like all the bad stuff felt like it was everywhere, especially fucking Transformers Dark of the Moon. <laughs> oh God, that did come out that year. Yeah. Huh? The artist. This is the artist year. Oh yeah. Which is a movie. Oh, I don't God. even think anyone even remembers it. Like I don't think anyone has any like strong feelings on it, but no one even really remembers the artist. No, the strongest feeling everyone has about the artist is, oh, that one. Yeah. And that guy was in like a bunch of movies for a little bit, and then he just disappeared again. Mm-hmm. Cause he's in Wolf of Wall Street. Oh yeah. And the oh, Monuments shit. Man, one of the worst movies I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the Monuments Man? I have seen the Monuments That's, Man. That movie is so bad. It's not good. That's a really bad movie. It, it doesn't work. Yeah, at all. Speaking of George Clooney, uh, The Descendants. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. I like I liked The Descendants. I don't know. That feels like one where like I remember enjoying it, but I feel like if I rewatched it, I'm going to be like, this is really weird about Hawaiian well, culture. Uh, then that's, that's the thing. Yeah. I have not seen it in years, so uh, let's leave an asterisk for that, but young Diego definitely enjoyed that. It's like, 2011 Gringo is like Hawaii is one of the 50 states. <laughs> like, now Matt Gringo is like free Hawaii. That's fucked up. Like, yeah, but like the- not not to cut you off from from running down the list because I love that we do this and like we, we bring a lot of like uh, like yeah I just like the context uh, like, like awareness of the movie. and context to yeah. all this. Um, in 2011, I'm also discovering like my taste in film mm. a lot. Yeah. This is when I'm like. Oh, the Alien Resurrection guy. The French guy made some movies in France. I should watch those. And this is when I like watch Amelie for the first time. I think mm-hmm. I watched City of Lost Children, and immediately I'm like, "Whoa, yeah, th- whoa! Th- I've not seen something like this before." And then you watch more movies, and it's like, "Well, there's other stuff out there like that." Yeah. But I love that director still. Um, and I- I'm just like, I'm getting exposed to like a lot more stuff. I watched Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Mm-hmm. That year, you know, yeah, like yeah. there's some fucking I mean, I'm like I have, discovering shit. I have a few of those that year too. Like I'd been I'd been a little more into the movie thing for like a little longer than you. Like I always talk about 2007 being my year, mm-hmm. that like that's when it starts kicking off. But like this is a separation and melancholia are both 2011. I probably saw them both in 2012, but still like that's a big like those are two big shift movies for me. Yeah, um, uh, I think Melancholy gets me watching Lars von Trier shit, for better mm-hmm. or worse. <laughs> yeah, I, I watch Melancholia, and then I'm like, wow, I gotta watch the other guys' other movies, and then I watch these other movies, and I'm like, I just gotta stick to Melancholia. Dogville's really good. Sure, whatever. Dogville's like that's the one I really like. You but... you you let me have mine. I'll let you have yours. Okay. Have you you've seen Dogville? I've seen Dogville. Okay. I, I don't like Dogville. Yeah, I like Dogville a lot, but it is like three hours of misery. Yeah. Like, I have never seen the uh, follow-up he did, though, because because Dogville was so, supposed to be part of a trilogy, and he did that sequel with Bryce Dallas Howard as the lead. I think uh, it's like, oh, Manderley. Yeah, it's like right? those movies that like, it was barely released, mm-hmm. and I've never seen it. I think that one's about racism, though, and I feel like I don't want to see that. Yeah. So, oh, the guy who said he understood Hitler doing a movie about racism. I can't imagine how that fucking like, falls apart. Isn't isn't Lars von Trier just like he just says shit? He just no. That's a, he's just a, he's trying to be like a provocative. Yeah, and shit. he's like Gaspar Noé. Like you know, yeah. I think we've had this. He, he's slightly less annoying Gaspar Noé. Yeah. yeah. Um. You know what? I'm gonna give him credit though. Oh, I like I Antichrist. Like Antichrist. Yeah, yeah. I we're like both Antichrist. going the same place, and I own. The extended cut of Nymphomaniac. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, which I watched one, <laughs> once and was like, I guess that's brilliant. Like, and was like, there's no part of me that like can get myself to watch it again. No, no. When I saw Nymphomaniac, that's when I was like trying to be like, this is what I'm supposed to like because I'm trying to like more serious stuff still. Yeah. And now I'm just like, that was embarrassing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me go back to Melancholia. Oh, and Breaking the Waves, which I also, I kind of like Breaking the Wave, but like also is kind of a like provocateur type movie. Yeah. That's a movie kind uh, of about its ending, you know? 
Yeah, right. yeah. Dance from the Dark, I I admire. Yeah, I, same. I, I admire the dance, but also like you would have to put a fucking gun to my head to get me to rewatch it. Like yeah, yeah. And then yeah. that that movie just like Bjork mm. has no positive uh, thing to say about her experience on that. Yeah. And that definitely colors what did he my, my experience watching the movie. What did I he... don't know specifically. That's the thing. But... It's like, I don't think she's ever said what he did specifically, but she was like, he was a fucking monster and I hated him. Like, yeah. And that every day on set, they would like fight. And it's just like, I'm just like, what was that about? Like, mm -hmm. what was he do like? What, why does he, cause honestly I watch his movies and I'm like, I don't see, like why any of any insanity behind the scenes that your actors would be necessary. Yeah. That's your oh, story with Dogville uh, where uh what's his name? Um Stone Skarsgard basically tricked Paul Bettany into being in to in Dogville. Mm. Did you have I told that story? No. Where Skarsgard had who had worked with Von Trier before was like he had you know, Skarsgard will do anything. And he was like, eh, Paul Bettany, come on, this will be fun. Like, I swear to God, it's like a great atmosphere on set. We'll have oh. a good time. And so Paul Bettany signs up for it. And then, like, a few weeks in, he's like, this is miserable. Why didn't you tell me that? And he's like, I knew it was going to be miserable. I just wanted to have you around so it would be less miserable. <laughs> James Conn's in that fucking movie. Jesus Christ. As uh, the big man. <laughs> and Udo Kier. Udo Kier is in a few Von Trier. Because Udo Kier is one of those guys who just will show up. Yeah, like, Udo Kier was in the last Puppet Master movie. God damn, man. Like, he'll fucking... He'll just go for it. <laughs> he just likes getting paid. I respect that. All right, can I, can I just for fun... Um, can I list the top eight films on Udo Kier's letterbox page? You know what? I have no idea what they are. Go for it. All right, number one, the original Suspiria. Makes sense. Oh my god, I forgot. <laughs> He's dubbed in the English version. He's dubbed. It's really weird. Yeah. Uh, Melancholia. My mm. own private Idaho. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Blade. Yeah, yeah, all right. Dogville. Mm -hmm. Dancer in the Dark. Armageddon. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least. Ace Ventura Pet Detective. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like that's that's incredible. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's the dream career right there. Like Oh man. I mean my God. Um yeah, just a guy who will be in anything. Yeah. I just rewatched the uh, Carpenter Cigarette Burns and he's great in that. Um, oh yeah. As the guy is yeah. the guy who wants the the film. Um but yeah, 2011 is just wild year. But it was like there was something about Drive that like stood out that year, you know, mm -hmm. of like it it was like a really good film, but also didn't feel inaccessible. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, where like sometimes like you have a movie like um, we need to talk about Kevin, which came out that same year and great movie. But like if you're watching it when you're younger, there's something about it where you're like. It's I like this, but it's out of my reach, you know, like mm -hmm. there's something that's a little beyond you or then around that you also have these big blockbuster movies, which I just don't think kids, especially at least I didn't. I never dreamed of like directing a blockbuster movie, you know, yeah, like if I ever had like like I wanted to make and drive felt like you drive was a movie you watched and it felt like you could make it, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's I, that was a huge thing for me because I think drive is a movie where. I've talked to so many people who are at least into film. We talk about like drive made me want to be a director for at least a few years. Mm -hmm. Like I think drive really means that to a lot of people, which is really interesting that it's then directed by Nicholas Wending Ruffin. Yeah. <laughs> because like, you watch any of his other movies, I'm about to praise him like crazy. Uh, and that very notion that you just brought up, none of his other movies have that accessibility. No, they really, not one of them. They really don't. And I love them. Mm. <laughs> Even the ones where I'm like, I, I don't know if this works, but yeah. like, God bless him. He's fucking going for it. I'm like, day one of Only God Forgives. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I think that was bad. And then I keep thinking about it. And then a week later, I'm like theorizing its relationship to like mythology and like mm. gods. And well, Only God Forgives that. was one of those ones where like, I was so hyped for that movie. Like, because, you know, it's his follow up to Drive. So. And also, I don't know what people, 
if people remember this, back in the day, Netflix had basically every one of his movies on there for the time, right? Like, yeah, yeah. So it was like you go see Drive, you're like, what the fuck? That was great. What else has this guy made? And then you spend a weekend watching Bronson. <laughs> Valhalla Rising and the Pusher films, like, yep, and which are very different than Drive, mm-hmm. but like also got me in like a better vibe for who he was because I I like all those movies, yeah, uh, I, and then Only too. God Forgives I was so hyped for it. It's like him Gosling again. The trailer looked wild. It comes out and was like immediately rejected by people, like. It got scathing reviews when it came out. I don't know if people remember that. I do it, remember it that. Was I remember also um, it was it got like a, a booed at Cannes, yeah. which is like if you're booed by the French, that is kind of a dream. But isn't you know, that like doesn't that become his thing? It like, does become his thing. Yeah, he is like again to bring up the idea of like the platonic ideal of certain things I want. He's the platonic ideal I have of a provocateur mm-hmm. because he's so high on his own bullshit. Yeah. But it's also not like Gaspar Noé. You know what I mean? It's not like repulsive to like, like my ethos. It as doesn't a human really being. seem like he's trying to be offensive with his stuff. Like in terms of his, provo- like in being provocative, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's but, like, he's not, are you like triggered and shit like yeah. that? Where Gaspar Noé is like, oh, you guys are going to fucking hate this movie. And I'm like, dude, I fucking hate you. Shut up. You were, <laughs> like, it, you were I don't want to hear you. Me. <laughs> like, yeah. And then I'm like, oh, my God, go to therapy or something. Yeah, man. exactly. Like, Jesus Christ, shut up. It's annoying when college students do it. You're like 60 years old. Yeah. Sorry. People just I, can't I, I, I'm like, what I'm bringing down. I know. Oh. I'm, I'm like fucking ranting about Gaspar Noé. <laughs> no, I, He's like he my totally enemy. He deserves it, frankly. <laughs> yeah. like, but, uh, but I only got, here's the thing. What, what I'm saying is, only God for Kids got such bad reviews. I didn't go see it in theaters. Whoa. Yeah. Like that's how bad it was received. I was like, that's oh, that sucks. I really wanted that to be good, and it got such bad reviews. I watch it on like on demand like a year later, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, okay, that wasn't like good, but I kind of enjoyed it, like. And it is one of those where it, like, it lingers, you know? Yeah. You think yeah, about yeah. it way longer than um, you really should, frankly. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. um, and I don't know if it's like a good movie, but I enjoy it. And that ends up being how I feel about most of Wending Refn stuff now. What have is- you seen his streaming shows? We're going to get you know, into have, all of his Yeah, stuff, I have not but... seen his two streaming things. Like, I, I just haven't dived in. Okay. I did see the Neon Demon in theaters. Did you like it? I did like the Neon Demon, but also I... was like, this is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, no, it is very ridiculous. I love the Neon Demon. Mm-hmm. And his whole ethos can be summed up in two things I'm about to bring up right now. Mm-hmm. When he, Him and his writer and cinematographer are questioned about what is the Neon Demon? He goes... I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is a cool title. Yeah. Um, I forget who said that him or like the cinematographer or whatever. It's just like, ah, oh, it's whatever you bring to it, basically. Yeah. Right. But it, essentially, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, along with the release of Only God Forgives, a year later, his wife, Liv Corfixen, uh, releases her documentary, My Life, directed by Nicholas Winding Refn. You no, know I've never uh, seen that. The, the making of Only God Forgives. Check it out. I think it's pretty good. Um, very revealing. Is it? Uh, you, is that why like people turn on him? Kind of like, is he come across as kind of a dopey guy in it? Yeah, or? yeah. And like, but he, he doesn't seem like a fucking major asshole. Like him and Ryan Gosling are like bros. Yeah. Like they're they're. I mean, they're like the infamous picture of them together at Cannes is them like kissing on the lips. Yeah. You know, just like fucking eating up the scenery, and it's like oh, that's kind of the vibe well, you yeah, want. I from will say also the collaboration the, in the build up to Only God Forgives was like peak people like enjoying his kind of quirkiness you know yeah yeah and like that immediately goes away after only god forgives comes out but there's a moment in the documentary i want to bring up where um his he's in bed and he's like so fucking distraught because he's like he's overwhelmed he's like overstimulated and he doesn't know where to go with the movie next and he just flat out says like his hand in his face like i don't know what movie i'm making like i I don't know what i'm doing anymore (laughs) And it's like a, a moment of like sheer vulnerability that is like we just don't 
have with artists. Yeah. Um, and I'm willing to bet he didn't know what he was making. And he was figuring it out as he went along. Uh, and I, I think he's actually good at figuring out what the movie is. Mm-hmm. Not in a traditional structural sense, but who gives a shit when you have images like this, in my opinion, you know? Yeah. Um, Where's something he, that's weird about him? Am I, I think he does... He has a pretty good grasp on structure at times. Like, I think he he does understand structure to some degree. I it almost feels like he's trying to avoid it purposefully at times. Yeah. And yeah, there's yeah. a part of me like there's that whole thing where like he does the commentary track on Maniac Cop 2, right? <laughs> Which I need to listen to, yeah. Jesus Christ. But there is a sort of like he is one like he's a big like he likes those vulgar auteurs. I think he's made like a big point about that, right? Oh my god. Yeah, I have to find it. Um his he had a website uh right before the pandemic or during the website or, or uh, during the, during the pandemic. The <laughs> like during the first year of the pandemic. Um where he had a website that would upload like lost exploitation films. Mm. And stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Because he, he just wanted people to have access to stuff. And like, like there's that. like music in drive is lifted from exploitation films. Yeah. Like yeah. like uh that oh my love that drops was like first played in like some fucking like mondo documentary shit that's like horribly racist like oh my god yeah he he clearly likes plumbing the depths and it's almost like he's trying to reverse engineer like exploitation films Mm -hmm. you know like it's it's like he's trying to make an exploitation film but like just the parts he likes about them and i think it gives him this unfortunate vibe of being a bit of a poser sometimes Mm. you know and i'm not i'm not even really criticizing that i just think it's just i'm just saying i think that's the vibe he gives off occasionally i i i see where that comes from yeah um i also have going to give him credit because on his instagram like just yesterday at the time of recording he, he shared in his story, like, hand in his face, sad, and the caption is, like, when production says you can't add any more neon. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, see, uh, he, he, knows, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's having he, fun. He's also, like, isn't he, is he in, uh, what's, what do you call it? Um, Death Stranding? Like, is he one of the guys that's in? Yeah, I don't know if he voices the, the character, but he's, like, they, Guillermo del Toro. themselves, but they all, like, kind of he did like a ton of motion capture of people. Yeah, and yeah. Him and Guillermo del Toro, I think, have like similar like appearances in the game. Think, they're like they're is, there. They're the models. I think Edgar Wright might even be modeled in it. Like a few, that makes sense. There's a few people like that in there, and it is just like Kojima's another guy who knows exactly what he's doing. Like yeah, in yeah. terms of just being insane. <laughs> yeah, just just being fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I've never played a single one of his games, but, like, I like him as, like, an artistic presence. You know what I mean? I'm going to shout out the uh, ref in his, like, I, he doesn't tweet that much these days, but when he does, it's usually, like, in support of Bernie Sanders, which I'm all... <laughs> yes! <like>, yes! <laughs> yes! I'm like, he's not even American. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've like, never been happier. I'm like, okay, cool, man. <laughs> like, he's a Bernie bro. <laughs> like... <laughs> But, Do you uh, remember uh, post drive when he was talked about like like for getting bigger movie uh, productions and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. You know, the comic book question was starting to come up like regularly. Around yeah, well, then. this is that. This is the beginning of that. Where like now you, if you make your indie film that's good, you jump to a big movie. And I bet you it would have happened to Refin on some level had he not jumped immediately into Only God Forgives. Yeah, but I also kind of love that because no, no, he's I'm, like, I'm happy too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, apart from him not getting sucked up into the machine and, like, probably it not working out, mm. he's just like, here, you guys think you know me because I made Drive. Like, you guys don't fucking know me. Mm-hmm. Like, not, like, in a spiteful way, but just, like, I, I here's my thing, but I'm never going to do the same version of that thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, also, although maybe some people would argue that it is the same version of that thing. I don't also, know. Also, <laughs> he's one of the people interviewed in Jodorowsky's Dune. How has that aged, that documentary? Um, there's think, some fucking people in that there's movie. There's some people. It's more just a, like, interesting little nugget, but it's also one of these movies where, like, it's more just like, wow, look at all these ideas. And then it's like, I can't believe Hollywood wouldn't give him money. He said he wanted to make a 12-hour movie. 
Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's why they didn't give him any money. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like I, I kind of, um, I haven't gone back to it in a while, but like I would go back to it cause it's like, I get inspired when I hear other inspiring ideas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, uh, not like a, not to the seal verbatim or whatever, just like you know what I mean, right? Like it's exciting to hear like the the potential, the limitless potential of human imagination, but it's not like all right, yeah, we should do that now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, it's this weird thing where it's like on he, he was he had the right idea on some level because like in the wake of Joe Dorassi's Dune not getting made, you get stuff like Star Wars and like Alien, you know, which like Alien just straight up lifted concept art from dune like that didn't get made to the point where like even prometheus was using unused concept art from jodorowsky's dune like and it's one of these where like he clearly had some idea now it doesn't mean anything because like he you know he didn't have like none of it came to fruition at all like Mm -hmm. uh and it's 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 interesting jodorowsky's a weird guy though like yeah he just he's but that was that weird year where like that documentary comes out and then he releases like his first movie in over a decade, The Dance of Reality, um, which I liked. I have not but, seen that. I don't think I actually like most of Jodorowsky's stuff, but also like I'm not like at his feet, like worshiping him, you know, like. Yeah. I feel like... Yeah. Fascinating filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I would probably not try to read too much into his personal life. Yeah. Frankly. He's a weird guy. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, he's also fucking 93 years old jesus yeah. christ the weirdos hang on for some reason yeah also like that documentary casually like goes over that he basically like mentally abused his son because he wanted his son to star in the movie jesus and was christ. like i had to break him so he could be the character and like the movie doesn't even get made yeah and it's like that's... what are you what are you doing man he did go viral like people that hadn't even seen the documentary did go he, that clip of him like getting money out of his pockets and like tearing it up being like this isn't real like that went viral back in the day i missed that but that's i remember that people people have had their finger on the pulse with that concept for Mm. longer than we realize you know um you remember all right here's something insane that happened i don't know if anyone remembers this so uh there's the joe dorowski's dune books which were like these big books of all the like storyboards for the movie right and some of the concept Mm -hmm. art it's like really thick um it was like impossible to adapt type shit you can find most of it online honestly uh it's interesting that's also the version of dune like he claims a lot of this stuff wouldn't have been in the movie but most scripts say they would that was the version that would have opened with dog men going to the temple of man do you know what I'm talking about? What? So no. Like, it's like a post-human galaxy at this point, but all the dogs we have left behind have like evolved into like sentient beings. Oh, okay, and, clear. Okay. And no, they go no, that to, clears it up. They go to yeah, they go to the Museum of Man, and then at that museum is like the that's the bookend for like the story of Dune. Because his story ends with Paul Atreides dying, but then becoming the planet Dune, and then that planet like going ar- like flying around the galaxy like changing everything right <laughs> yeah okay it, yeah all right yeah 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 <laughs> that's that's what it was um <laughs> uh well we need people to start dropping acid again yeah that's what we need <laughs> kind i don't know but no i mean t- take care of yourself i'm joking but like i, I don't know the fuck i've never done acid i'm the only like, guy the, out the there fucking... being like Mind expanding drugs will set you free, man. Is like fucking Joe Rogan. So yeah, yeah. So maybe we're rightfully moving away from that. Yeah, but uh, all right. So like those books exist. I think there was o- there's only a handful of them, and one of them was put up for auction recently. And some crypto bros like bought it. With the promise that they would adapt it into a film, right? Sure. sure. And that, like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to adapt it. You, you can't do that. Like, you don't have the rights to it. You just bought a book of Dune concept art. You didn't buy Dune, <laughs> and it like immediately fell apart. Like, it was one of those where like they got a. It was one of the like that early wave 
of all this crypto bullshit that was going on with NFTs. It was like, we're going to make an NFT movie of Jodorowsky's Dune. Yeah, and course, yeah. And if you want to know, hey, if you have any misgivings about AI, uh, in January 2003, uh, that looks like Jodorowsky Zoom is involved in some sort of AI artwork generated thing. So that's just, to me, that is proof positive that AI is yet another bubble that yeah. it is not going to work in any capacity. It's going to destroy a bunch of careers, unfortunately, but yeah. it's, it's not going to be this thing everyone thinks it is. No, no. It's also like a lie. Cause like you said, like it's every artificial intelligence program is not true artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. Like, it's, they've got this library, this vast library of source art that they kind of manufacture into new composited art that you're seeing. Yeah. And you're like, wow, this is like, no, no, no. It's still coming from human beings. You're just letting the machine exploit them yeah. because some company set this up so they could make money off of it. So the, the very idea of like artificial intelligence isn't even this. Yeah. And if there was ever an intelligence that was crafted artificially, it like the, 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 the neural networks that make the human mind work the way it does mm. doesn't exist in computers. Yeah, yeah. It, what I'm it, saying is that fucking, like, yeah. if you have any sort of existential dread about this stuff taking over, it's not. Like it's going to burst just like every other thing they've tried to do. Mm-hmm. Like I'm... Like, I don't think there's any more obvious thing than like, all the NFT guys now pivoting to AI, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So, it's unfortunate it's going to be, like, pivot to video when, like, that destroyed a bunch of online ecosystems. But it won't it won't actually destroy culture. So, I think that's yeah. at least a positive. But uh, That is a positive. Yeah. What? Uh, people are dumb, man. People are fucking dumb, uh, except for people that like Drive because they're right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's a great fucking movie. Good movie. Um, they're on the Letterboxd year for 2011. It's the highest. It is the it's the yeah. most viewed movie of 2011. Yeah. and the highest rated, which is also probably it's still is, and it also feels like one of those where like even people who like immediately abandon. Wending Ref and After Drive haven't like gone back and been like actually Drive was terrible. Yeah, it yeah. seems to be the one that just works across the board. Yeah, and it is. I mean, I could show that movie to anyone and it would work. I haven't had it fail yet. You know. Yeah, it's a when it like... came out. I will say that's when it failed. Uh, at least for like not not across the board. Obviously, a lot of people well, it loved it right money. out the gate. It made a lot it also, of money. Yeah, and. But, like, there were people being like, I thought this was going to be a Fast and Furious movie. Yeah, the infamous lawsuit mm. that occurred and failed. Yeah, but didn't yeah, someone just win a lawsuit like that, and now it's like, movies can be sued for false advertising? Uh, no, the lawsuit is currently in progress, because mm. I, it was an Ana de Armas stan who mm. saw that she was cut out of the movie yesterday, which is a bad movie. Yeah. Uh, it's probably for the best she wasn't in it. And um, they were like, well, they advertised her in the movie, and she's not in it. And it's like, well, scenes get cut out of movies all the time. Mm-hmm. It's normal. Uh, but whatever, whatever. Yeah. Um, I will say Drive, I remember watching that opening weekend. Now, after that mindset I established about me like discovering like different types of movies, Drive isn't that different of a movie. Yeah. It, it's, it's not. It's a very well-made version yeah. of a familiar movie um, with some like extra little atmosphere, prolonged silences between the actors and stuff like that, specifically uh, Ryan Gosling's Driver character, which... People love to make memes of because it's very funny. Mm. Um, and I remember walking out with friends and they were like, that was bad. That was so boring. Really? And I was just like, well, I'm, I'm not friends with these people anymore. That's unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that guy was an asshole. Mm. Um, but I was just like, I just had like the most moving experience I've had all year in a theater. What are you talking about? Why do you feel this way? And I was so curious, like genuinely curious, like why do I see what I see? Why don't they see it? And what do they see? And they were just like not having it. They're like, no, I should have been more action heavy and stuff. And I was yeah. like, okay, so that's not the movie we're talking about then. But I will that's, say this is just that. We talk about this being like a peak movie time for me. This was also me being like a peak hater because <laughs> like this is when I'm like, fucking Transformers 3 is the death of cinema. Like, Drive is the real shit. Like, this is where I'm at in 2011, you know? <laughs> well, but, Drive is the real shit, so yeah, you're half right. Yeah. 
but it's also like, oh, buddy, you have no idea how much further down it goes. But <laughs> <laughs> I do remember, I'm trying to remember what movie I went to see. Uh, I went to see a movie, because they still did midnight screenings at this time. I went oh, to see yeah. some movie the, the day Transformers 3 comes out. And however it was timed, I'm leaving the theater right when people are showing up for the midnight screening. And I remember seeing the people I hated most from high school <laughs> at the midnight screening for Transformers. And just being like, why? <laughs> but I honestly, I don't remember what I would have been seeing. I did a midnight screening for Transformers 3. Really? And half the people I went with hated it. And I was like, no, 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 this is cool and fun. Were you like initially on board with Transformers? I was, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, and then I had my turn. And then I was like, all right, no, some of those are fucking dog shit. But I do like some of them. Mm -hmm. Do you Um, like them or do you like moments in them? I like the first Transformers. I like moments in three. Because it's a good movie. No, it's Uh, not. And then Transformers 5, I just admire as like, a fucking behemoth of a of whatever. Like, there's no word for what that movie is, mm. um, which is why I admire it. Uh, but for Drive, I, it's got this weird legacy, even outside of like the film world, because mm. uh, you know, like the sad boy memes on TikTok and Instagram yeah. and Twitter, right? Like, do they play the a songs lot of them from they this? play the songs from Drive, like real human being and stuff like that, and like under your spell. But there's also like the photo of Ryan Gosling as the driver. That's like a popular thing. Ryan Gosling is like the poster boy for sad boys on the internet. Even though his best performance is in The Nice Guys. I guess it's because of Drive. It is. And it's like, like there's all these memes like, babe, please stop. You're not Ryan Gosling in Drive. And then they'll they'll have the picture of like that meme face guy and he'll be like, I drive. And it's like, it makes me laugh every time. I guess what it is, is it's Drive and Blade Runner. Yes, that's, Drive, that's, Blade Runner. Only God Forgives might sneak in there once in a while, but I'm not lying to myself and saying it has that cultural yeah, I, power. I, yeah, I, I think it's a thing of like, I wonder, I guess the question is how many people who saw movies like The Notebook or Crazy Stupid Love, which came out the same year as Drive, which has Gosling in it, like, did they cro- Did they happen to see Drive? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, how many people oh, saw Drive because they were into Gosling? Yeah, um, I, that, I'm willing to bet a lot of people that had very soft eyes for him mm, saw Drive. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say that's impossible. He was also, that, this is also the year after Blue Valentine, which was like at the time like one of the last big like NC-17 movies that came out. Oh my God, is that movie NC-17? I believe at the time it was. Okay, I, I, there was some controversy about that if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, because. Uh, uh, yeah, it's NC-17, due to a scene depicting cunnilingus, because of course. Yeah. Um, the, all right, don't worry, people, uh, uh, the studio appealed and got an R rating for it. Oh, Without oh, any changes. God. So let's thank the heroes at the Weinstein Company. <laughs> oh, oh, no! <laughs> so, hey, it was a different time. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. a similar time. <laughs> but that was a weird, like, that was another, it was just kind of always on Netflix streaming movie, was Blue Valentine. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Uh, Crazy Stupid Love is back on there, I think. Is it? It's that's because on some streaming. That's because whoever yeah. owns it doesn't know they own it. Crazy Stupid Love? Yeah. Have you seen Crazy Stupid Love? I saw it once and did not like it. Okay. Now... You have to understand, it's written by Dan Fogelman, who I think is a talented writer. Um, Crazy Stupid Love takes, like, every sitcom trope and puts it into, like, an hour and a half long movie. Uh-huh. And I love sitcoms, so it worked gangbusters on me. Who the fuck is Dan Fogelman? Uh, he's the guy who would go on to create This Is Us. Unfortunately, he also wrote and directed um, Life Itself, which is, as I have mentioned before, one of the worst movies ever made. Yeah. But you so, st- you know, you, 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 drop, you win some, you lose some. You dropped Dan Fogelman like that was someone I should know. And I'm like searching no. my brain. And I'm like, <laughs> Dan Fogelman? <laughs> you could probably tell Dan Fogelman he wrote Crazy Stupid Love and he'd be like, Dan Fogelman? 
um, yeah, that movie worked like gangbusters for me back in the day. Yeah. And I'm cool leaving it back there because there's some shit in that movie that I just catch like brief memories of and i'm like hmm that probably wouldn't fly today yeah probably (laughs) (laughs) steve carell has the weirdest career man (sighs) steve carell just doesn't want to be michael scott anymore and unfortunately that is his best role yeah but he also like doesn't he not win an emmy for michael scott yeah i think that's not his fault i think that broke him like i think the fact that he didn't win that emmy now he's like i have to win something god damn it like, yeah well because what's that one movie beautiful boy which is a bad movie i never saw um, that uh it, it's doesn't understand what it's dealing with but there's a moment where he's yelling at timothy chalamet and it's just michael scott <laughs> like it, he can't help it it's not his fault and he's not bad in it it's just he is who he is you know he has the same cadence as yelling at dwight <laughs> like <laughs> and it's so serious I just remember him in Foxcatcher. Do you remember Foxcatcher? Yes. It's like ornithologist, philatelist, philanthropist. I just remember him saying that and doing coke in that helicopter in Foxcatcher. <laughs> I like Foxcatcher. I don't know how people feel about it now. I don't, that's that guy's last movie, right? Is it? That's a shame. Yeah, that's a shame. That's coming. Yeah, up. Bennett Miller. Excuse yeah, me. That's, that's coming close. up in a decade. Oh god, man. Because he does Funny Ball, which is outstanding. Um and Foxcatcher, which is just like I get why it did because Foxcatcher is such a like he he deliberately like sidesteps a lot of the uh the crazier stuff about Foxcatcher, and I think that upset people when it mm. happened. Because like this that happened near where I live, by the way. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I think you're telling me. Yeah, the DuPont family. Um, but I guess he's directing an adaptation of A Christmas Carol next. <laughs> well, why not? Ben Miller. I guess yeah. we could use another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Muppets mm-hmm. did it best, but they should bring <laughs> You're in. Correct. They should put one Muppet in it as like a reference to keep the <laughs> legacy strong. Yeah, because the Muppets don't have much going on right now. Yeah, Muppets, so Muppets, they should be getting work. What if that was? What if Bob Iger came back to Disney and was like, "Every movie needs to have one Muppet in it." Then I'd call him a genius. <laughs> just like people are like, like now he knows he can do whatever he wants because the last guy was so terrible. So he's just coming in saying insane shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like you every have to movie, put... one Muppet. It's like, yeah. do you now... mean we have to make like an original Muppet for the movie? And he's like, no, one of the pre-established Muppets has to be in the movie. Well, then I'd want, like, a Muppet in, like, Spider-Man or Ant-Man. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. in the background, it would make them better. Statler and Waldorf fucking roasting Ant-Man. <laughs> like... <laughs> I just, I, now I'm always just going to think of the Kermit the Frog uh, Spider-Man meme. I actually don't know. Do the... you know that one? No, I don't. No, he's like, with great power comes great big booty bitches. Oh, I've never heard <laughs> that. Jesus. <Yeah. laughs> It just like it caught me so off guard when I first heard that. And wow! I just couldn't stop laughing. Wow. It's so stupid. You know, we're like an hour in, and I'm still on the like 2011 thing. But like 2011 is also Fast Five, which is a great. Oh movie. yeah, great uh, fucking movie. Probably what great people were movie. expecting more from Drive. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. And I remember Real Steel, the Sean Levy movie. Oh, yeah, his best movie. Yeah, that was a weird one where, like, that was one of those movies I remember coming out and everyone was just like, why does this exist? Yeah. Like, it was one of those. <laughs> We're like, how did this get through so many people? But. And then you're like, oh, this is this is pretty good. Yeah, it's actually fine. <laughs> this is good. Yeah. yeah. 2011 is technically the year Margaret comes out. Oh, oh, well, yeah, technically. Yeah. That one had, like, such a fucked up, like, I didn't know that movie existed until, yeah. like, five years ago. It was one of those movies that, like, it almost didn't exist. <laughs> like, Yeah. It, like, screened once, and then it's like, it's not getting released ever again. And it's sat on a shelf somewhere. But Oh, Contagion also came out. I think I brought up Contagion. Did, but I right, like well, Contagion. Well, I think Contagion yeah. is the movie Soderbergh jumped to after his version of Moneyfall. Money ball fell apart. Ah, yes. Because uh, working out some stuff there. Yeah, because uh, who did he bring over? What's his name's in that? 
Um, Matt Damon. No, Dimitri Martin. Jude Law. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Dimitri Martin was going to be in Moneyball in the Jonah Hill role. Ah. And I believe, because, you know, Big Shark used that. to do all that shit on stage where, like, he'd walk up and, like, he's like, I have a chart. Like, it would, like that would be, like, his bit, remember? <laughs> like, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. And I think that was what he was going to do in Moneyball to explain how Moneyball worked. <laughs> I gotta be honest, like, I know, like, I, I'm, like, the guy like, with mixed opinions on Steven Soderbergh. Everything I've heard about Soderbergh's Moneyball sounds like the worst movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> I just gotta be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like there was gonna be like a Clippy like that showed up, like Clippy from Microsoft Word to like explain statistics to people. <laughs> like, doesn't that just sound awful? <laughs> like, I don't know. Not if Soderbergh does it. Yeah, but Soderbergh did. Uh, what do you call it? The fucking laundromat. Don't, like, it's, I know. I knew you were gonna bring but, it up. I was like, I'm don't saying, say like, it. That script sounds like the laundromat like early. Like Maybe. it would have been a little close to the laundry. Maybe less brown face. I guess which would have made it better. Brown face is that thing where it's like laundromat where you're like, ah, it doesn't really work, but I kind of get what. Ah, no, nope, brown face, we're out. Yep, like, yep, yep. <laughs> which is a weird. People give fucking Soderbergh such a fucking pass. I'm sorry, <laughs> film Twitter. I just got to throw that out there. Like, I don't give him a pass for that one. The, the guys who make it, mistakes, though, and I like, can never recover from them. It's like I get it. Like that's your. But Soderbergh has done some weird shit in his movies, <laughs> and the victory at the end of Side Effects is a man keeping a woman who's not mentally ill drugged in a mental institution. Yeah, that that's that's weird. That's strange. That's it's weird. weird. <laughs> I think that's a great movie. It's a good movie, but that's a weird that's way to weird. end it. That's weird. It's a very, very weird movie. A great poster too on Letterboxd. Great, right great now. poster. Yeah, that was one. I saw that in theaters too. Like that was yeah. one. But that yeah, I saw that too. Um, very strange experience though because it was like I, I i don't know what i'm watching mm. you know what i mean not like stylistically strange like i didn't know it was a mystery mm. <laughs> for like the first hour mm. <laughs> and i was like wait wait you know wait what? what are we i, what I had are we a weird one with that where i was worried it wasn't a mystery for the first hour because I was like, is this some bullshit, like, anti-pharmaceutical movie? Where it's like... Yeah. Where it's yeah. like, is this going to be like, don't do fucking antidepressants shit. You just need nature, man. Like, mm-hmm. I was worried... Because I didn't know much about Soderbergh at the time. So, And then when it turned out to be a mystery, I was like, oh, thank God. Like, it's not... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not one of those movies. But then it does end with a woman getting drugged in a mental institution. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one of those things, too, that, like, so much of that, like, style of, like, thriller narrative is like, well, you just gotta, like... You, you gotta pick yourself up by your bootstraps, which is, like, again, we talked about cinematic shorthand for a while. Mm-hmm. Like, um, that's a great cinematic shorthand for, like, overcoming an obstacle. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really translate to the human experience in the real world, mm-hmm. and it might endorse some accidentally very problematic things, but it's such, like, a great shorthand for movies, mm-hmm. and it's, like, it's so complicated. It's, like, we gotta stop doing that. Uh, I don't think anyone's really found a, a better shorthand yet mm-hmm. we, not to say we can't we absolutely can and we should but it's just like such a weird like cultural thing mm-hmm. that sticks around for a while side effects um, is also a little weird where it's like it's not really a movie about getting justice for anyone like it's more just like jude law was like this collateral damage in this scheme and like he's get. it's almost like him getting revenge yeah like he's kind of clear his name which i understand you know. yeah, yeah, for those that haven't seen side effects, yeah. uh, I'll just say the the poster is Rooney Mara's face. Mm-hmm. The the header on Letterboxd is Rooney Mara and Channing Tatum smiling. Mm-hmm. The movie frames that relationship as basically like a soapy melodrama, mm-hmm. a joyous romance. Mm-hmm. And then by the end, you're like, why the fuck did they sell that movie? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I guess to get butts and seats, you know but like that's not that the movie. movie. Because it got that movie to sixty six million dollars at the box office. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so that's why they did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Soder Soderberg, uh, interesting career. Yeah. Wasn't Soderberg also potentially doing this movie, or am I fucking this up? Am I really, this up this up? is a ad- adapted from a novel, so like it feels like he could have been in talks to do it but it could just Mm. be the digital thing like yes 
Yes, this is one of those movies that shot digital, like, not early, but this is the era where, like, no, 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 look at what we can do. Yeah. This what is, like, the a true capability. Do you have- uh, the Ari Alexa. Okay. Yeah. For some reason in my mind I had it was shot on the red cameras. There was like I a mean, weird there was like a weird peak of the red cameras around this time. The red cameras were used for a lot of television productions at that time. Mm-hmm. Um I found that out specifically because I loved the show Justified mm-hmm. and Dexter ended up getting shot on them, I believe. But I remember I went to the this is the first time I'd ever done this too, like mm-hmm. 2012. I was like I like the look of this show. What? Why am I drawn to this? Now, I'm, I'm questioning stuff for the yeah. first time around that era. And Justified just fucking looks terrific. And the the low ISO or the high ISO is like really good for the night scenes. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like midnight showdowns and shit like that in Justified. So it's like, all right, we gotta we gotta do night shoots, but we don't want to be here all day. So let's fucking set up some some big lights. Hey, here's the moon. All right, you guys stand over there. <laughs> we'll just run the camera. And it's like super time saver like it, it, that was the big thing for like reds it was like a yeah. time saver um was, it, uh, allowed was a lot of information did soderbergh shoot shay on the red camera he may have I, it's gotta I, be like an early one though. yeah i think that i remember that being a story around that time and that was the whatever he shot it on was the one where they had to like bring like chunks of ice to like put on the cameras to keep them from overheating uh, like you can yeah. find video of them like with like giant blocks of ice, just like keeping them cool. Like mm-hmm. it's kind of wild shit. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so drive was shot digitally in the Ari Alexas. Uh, there was also the Canon EOS five D Mark II, which is a consumer grade camera for some shots. I'm assuming for like when they had to attach stuff to the side of the cars, because mm-hmm. there's some, some great like angles during a car chase and stuff like that. Um, you can now get this camera used at B and H for four hundred dollars. Well, there you go. Go shoot drive, everyone. Yeah, I mean it. It still fucking looks terrific. Yeah. Um, so if you're you're fucking concerned about like not looking professional, if you can't pay like a million dollars to get your movie made, don't worry. Just you, you can you can do a lot with the digital information in cameras yeah. now. Uh, and th- I think this is one of the first ones that really showed people like, oh, they don't have to look like, um, like I, I love chair. But like it's got like a look to it, like, yeah. right? Like it's the it's not very saturated. Well, it has a look that like makes that. you immediately go, "Oh, digital!" Like yeah. Whereas yeah. like which drive, you could be like, "This this isn't film, but it couldn't possibly be digital." And then you're like, "Well, I guess yeah. it's digital." Like that it did have an interesting vibe at the time. Like yeah, it felt very different in a lot of ways. Um. Uh, and I, I didn't, like, get a bunch of information on this because I, I didn't really find any. Um, but there is uh, something about the, the digital night in this movie mm. that I really like. Yeah. Like the, the halations from the streetlights and stuff like that. Like, it not only does it look like those old, like, again, like yeah. Thief, right? But instead but of Thief having, like, that's why, that blue coating. You, you can know? tell that's why man has pivoted so much. Like, his obsession with, like, the skyline, especially of Los Angeles and, like, Heat... Like, you can tell that's why he's pivoted to digital so much. Because you can just get that so much better. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But also, and, and Ruffin... uh, there's, like, I mean, that cut to the title, which is the shot of the city, is, like, one of the best-looking shots of its time. Like, that's... It makes Los Angeles look way sexier than it is. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, that area of Los Angeles, it... I don't think people understand. It smells so bad <laughs> all the time. Um, also, no, shout I, I, out to I've Staples been, Center. I've been in LA. It's like there's good parts and bad parts of LA, right? Like whatever. But yeah, just yeah. looking at LA, it's like a fucking joke. Like it's like no one builds a city like this. Yeah, it, it is not sustainable. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see how it all unfolds this decade when people can't afford to buy new cars anymore. For a preview, look at Southland Tales. <laughs> oh. My boy. Which was not shot digitally. Um, no, you know, it probably should have been. <laughs> I mean, hey, maybe. Uh, get in on that get uh, early. vulgar auteur angle again. Yeah. We should have done Southland Tales. Make that next year. Yeah. Is that a film yeah. blockbuster or failed awards, though? Yes. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like this it's is... bombed at the box office like horribly, but also has the infamous can screening where like like people like rioted over how bad it was. <laughs> like... Yeah, that's uh, 
Oh, can. Oh, can. Can Film Festival, you. <laughs> you know, should I go to that this year? I'm going to go to that this year. You should, because you know who I saw was there? The guy who runs the YouTube channel, Your Movies Suck. That makes me not want to go. <laughs> <laughs> but someone's got to balance it out. I guess like, so. I don't have anything against like... that guy. I don't know much about him, but like... Oh! Oh, I have some tweets to send you. <laughs> oh, what did he say? Um... He may or may not have uh, in- endorsed uh, what's what's the animal one, the the animal sex thing. The what? The animal sex. What's what's it called when people want to have sex with animals? Bestiality. Thank you. Oh, you um, made a tweet. That's the only time I'll ever say thank you for something as horrific right. as that. Bestiality. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> take that. Out of he apparently was like trying to like endorse it and i was like oh boy there's probably something else going on that's there. peak he must be a libertarian that is peak libertarian brain rot oh, yeah like, people could do whatever they want if you want to fuck an animal go ahead <laughs> like, yeah um because you know like yeah. that starts from a good place i'm just gonna i'm gonna defend this for a second like oh my god that starts from a good place of like when you get into libertarianism you grow up with this really heteronormative view of society and then you're like, hey, what gay people do in their own home is fine. It's like, you know what, kinks, like, not my thing, totally fine. And then you have a pivot at a certain point, <laughs> and it's, am I going to endorse bestiality? <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you're like, you either stop being a libertarian or you endorse it. The other weird pivot people do, and this is why it's such a big thing where people, you know, libertarians are always like, I don't know, I think the age of consent law is too high. Like... <laughs> That is yeah, and then one. you're like, oh no. Like, that's the although I think they've abandoned that. Now they're just like anti-sex. Libertarian the Libertarian Party's gotten weird. Like, I still Could have fooled me. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, they at least like were crazy in like a fun way. <laughs> like yeah. now they're like endorsing all sorts of like racist shit, you know? And it's like, what happened, man? But they also were the type of people they were the useful idiots where it'd be like we got to get rid of Title IX because that's, you know, government regulation. And, like, Title IX is, like, one of those things that protects women in, like, sports mm. and shit. And it's, like, libertarians are not – they become the useful idiots to people that, like, have really bad agendas. But then also your brain rots and you endorse speciality. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not know that. That's crazy. Where did that – out that's insane that is insane uh when you, could, you could all look it up when uh, the, i don't know it was a while back a while back because like i feel like i would have heard about that oh it's out there wow, wow. uh yeah F- fuck that guy um they, i mean they also just seem like the most unhappy person mm. on the internet which yeah. is saying something well they just they review movies that suck like which is like low-hanging fruit man like you can any movie sucks if you think hard enough you know yeah it's like driver, yeah, but then they why always, the driver they always just talk, talk like this? Yeah, why, why they always you... talk like this, and then they speak as everything's a matter of fact. Yeah. And it's it's like it's an unironic plinket bit. You yeah, know? yeah. It's like at least the red letter media guys had enough foresight to be like the only person that can review the Star Wars prequels this way is like a deranged serial killer <laughs> who's off his meds. Like <laughs> it's like oh, like that was the only way that made sense. They at least had that angle. Yeah. You know? And I'm not saying yeah, your it's... movie sucks, guy is a deranged serial killer, but I'll I'll hang on to that first description. <laughs> <laughs> um, but whatever, uh, fuck them. Okay, uh, they probably do hate this movie. It's okay if you don't like this movie. I don't by think the way, does he, the your movie sucks. I just don't feel like he likes any movie. Yeah, like I I don't know if I'm always it, you should be. I mean, it's a trap you can end up in where if you're so negative, you can only you can only review movies negatively. You know. Mm-hmm. And some people like they look I I just disagree with the idea of like you should go into a movie ready to hate it. You know, some people think that's the right way to watch a movie. And I just dis I feel like the exact opposite. I go into every movie wanting to love it, you know? Yeah. And I don't know, maybe some people, I don't know. I don't know what the correct answer is. Looks like your movie sucks. I had had a letterbox at one point. Oh no, it was a fan account. That person has fans. That's like the most disturbing thing I've ever heard in my entire yeah. life. He's very popular. I know. I mean, 
I mean, Star Wars like nostalgia critic though, and I guess they're still popular ish. I guess, but I think he appeals to children. Like, yeah. I think all all of these guys must just appeal to children, though, right? Maybe you know who I want to give credit to, um, and because this is because I watched them at the time of the release of Drive, and was someone who uh, I, I checked out like for the YouTube reviews for those couple years where I actually watched that stuff. This was a guy I'd kind of go to, not to really have my opinions like endorsed, but just to like hear. Uh, was Chris Stuckman? He was the first person who reported on the only God forgives uh, booing at Cannes, and wh- and then he talked about why he was still excited, and then uh, like gave like like a, a real like honest reaction when the movie came out. He's making and a movie now, right? He's making a movie now, and he seems like a guy who's actually evolved. Like I don't think he gives ratings for movies anymore because he's. <laughs> Not only because he's trying to make stuff and not trying to like, like shit the bed regarding like potential business deals, right? Yeah. Which is important to do. Um, but just someone who's like, like love him or hate him, like doesn't seem like a guy who's interested in like saying something's good or bad, mm-hmm. which is a low bar, right? But that is a bar that a lot of people don't seem to cross. They're like, no, 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 this is bad or this is good, and like. Well, we have to determine that, that from talking about art. Yeah, and well, then you, that's the wrong way to approach it. Make your art. brand the angry critic guy. Like, what do you do? You know? Yeah. And I feel like some people there there is that thing that like I think some people realize, like, hey, I can actually do positive reviews and no one will complain. And some people never learn that, you know? Mm-hmm. That's a shame. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't I don't like love this channel. Um I, I do like that they've basically become the counter to Cinema Sins, though it's literally called Cinema Wins. Oh yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, like it's not like super in depth theoretical stuff. It's just like here's all the stuff they liked in the movie. It's yeah. like you know what, no one else is doing that. Fuck it, go for it. Yeah, if you're gonna do, I honestly, it's one of those things where it's like I think Cinema Wins. I'm not. It's definitely not like deep criticism, but it's a, I think a better way to look at a movie than Cinema Sins. You know. Yeah. In my also opinion. those people, yeah. Also, cinema sins also seem like the most unhappy people yeah. on the internet. Well, that was such a like targeted brand thing. Like they were some of the like early people. Be like, we're just gonna throw a bunch of shit against the wall, see what sticks with the algorithm, and cinema yeah. sins ended up being it. So, um, hey, yeah, that's depressing. When did they start? You know what? That's something I actually I'm gonna Google right now. So I think that changes cinema. I culture. actually think it's around the same time as Drive, or at the yeah. very least, like the same year, maybe. Let's see, see if I'm right. I, I think I'm right. 2012. So the year oh, I'm so close. Yeah. So these guys. That's when. That's when the death of culture begins. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Hey, they uh, featured guest narration from uh, the nostalgia critic on how the Grinch stole Christmas. Oh, it's Cinema Sins. That guy from Screen Junkies who I think got canceled. Um, did Iron Man three and the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson has done three oh. episodes of Cinema Sins. Wow, that's um the worst thing ever. Because <laughs> that's that's a guy who also like just doesn't make people excited about science. He's just like, used actually. To. He used to, and then something happened, man. Yeah, maybe he had to, like, pivot after he got accused of sexual harassment. Yeah, there's always hey. that. There's always that. <laughs> yeah. Um, really? yeah something, something tends to happen with these people. After they're accused of sexual <laughs> harassment, they start, start using the word woke a lot. Yeah. And they start getting angrier and more cynical online. Yeah. Something, something's got to be related to that. I, I can't put my finger on it. There's a list of people criticizing Cinema Sins <laughs> too, which is pretty funny. <laughs> it's like Ryan Johnson, Damon Lindelof, see Robert Cargill. <laughs> That's awesome. Samper, there we go. And the guy who did Kong Skull Island, but we don't talk about him. Yeah, it's, it's the one time he's ever been right. Yeah. And then also maybe Google what he's been up to yeah. besides making movies. Um. It's one of those ones where, like, that one kind of disappeared from the internet for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but seems to have. Is he even doing anything now? Uh, he was supposed to do the Metal Gear movie, but I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, that's guess what? He's in Death Stranding. That might explain some things. Ah. So. Hey. Nah. What a, nah. What a guy. Well, here, counter to that person who's, a, like, 
a bad director just in general too because mm-hmm. uh, Kong Skull Island is fucking awful people liked that uh, movie when it came out though man people like that movie still people are like you know out of all the MonsterVerse movies that one is the most fun or that's whatever. the Brie Larson movie people defend I know it's like, fucking psychotic yeah there's something it's, something is wrong here <laughs> I know I was I was just saying how like we shouldn't determine whether things are good or bad to talk about art that movie's not art that movie's dog shit mm. And it's bad, and you should all feel bad for liking it. Mm. Uh, but I saw some, like, one of those YouTube culture critics saying, like, oh, Skull Island's the way to do a MonsterVerse movie because it has all these fun, memorable characters. And I'm like, no, it just has John Goodman and Samuel <laughs> Jackson. John Goodman, and you'll always remember John Goodman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, no, you're just a mark. <laughs> like, that's what you are. It's fine. But uh, a counter to that person's terrible filmmaking, Nicholas Winding Refn, is a very good filmmaker. I was talking earlier about how maybe he wouldn't have fit into like a, a bigger budget blockbuster spectrum of filmmaking. Maybe he would have because like, you know, this is really different from his other stuff. And I think he, he like he made a really great like thriller. Like, yeah, it's yeah. like got slow melodramatic moments that I think are really moving and striking. But he's he's also just clearly got like a knack. But for, how much like, would he have been willing excitement? to play the game had he been like on a big budget movie? Maybe not. Like, I think that is important to bring up too. Because yeah. like there's a there's that story with the Green Hornet, the the Seth Rogen Green Hornet, where he's like the big lesson he learned from that movie was that like at a certain budget level, uh, there's just too many people, like too many too many people have your their eye on what you're doing, you know, and you have mm-hmm. to get approval from like so many different people that it becomes untenable at a certain level. And yeah. that's why he's like, every movie I've made since then, we've deliberately kept the budget under a certain level just to be left alone. <laughs> I wonder if, like, Wedding Ruffin, had he been put in a position like that? Because it seems like where he goes, he he just doesn't have that oversight, you know? Yeah. He's going to be one of the last people to get a Netflix deal like that, you know? With mm-hmm. his recent- oh, yeah. Uh, for anybody curious, I would recommend Copenhagen Cowboy. I have not finished it. Um, and then he did Too Old to Die Young for Amazon. Which is fucking wild. Mm -hmm. Although Copenhagen Cowboy might be more wild. I don't want to say what it's about, but just go watch it Uh, if you like his stuff. At some point. (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, it goes places, we'll say. In terms of directing, like the first, like that opening chase is kind of like a distilled, like perfect little movie, right? Mm -hmm. Even the people that don't like this movie tend to like that scene. You know what though I do I suddenly remember a Cinema Sins guy sitting next to me one time watching this. Like trying to argue that like the cops would still be able to see the car for some reason. Hmm. He was like, what is it, like floodlights or something like that? I don't know if that's the word. He brought up something, he was like, there would be some sort of lights on the car still, even if you're parked. And I was just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is the driving backwards in this movie, which does seem unrealistic, but uh, yeah, who, yeah, who whatever. cares? <laughs> yeah, who, who gives a fuck? It's yeah, none of that. None of that matters. Oh, you remember? Here's something interesting. Another 2011 thing. This is also the year that Tarantino's best movie of the year list leaks. Do you remember this? Oh, this is when he has Green Lantern on, right? I don't remember if he had it on the best of list. I don't. I really don't remember that. He had. Okay. Rise, I, he liked it. He had Rise of the Planet of the Apes on there. I remember that being the big surprise. Okay. Um, but he it was this thing of like he he had this website that he was in communication with and he sent them the list and they were only supposed to publish the best of list, but then they also published the movies he didn't like and also the movies that were close but like not like good enough. And he had drive under the close but not good enough. And I, I that dude just has a weird taste. I'm guessing it's the digital thing. Like that's maybe that's what it's gotta be, right? Yeah. Like it's such a, a digital movie. Like he was probably like, I can't deny it's a, it's a good movie, but I can't give my blessing to a digitally shot movie. Yeah. And then he put Sucker Punch on his worst of the year list, <laughs> which uh, people had to move on. Yeah, if Twitter saw that nowadays, they would have like a meltdown. And the other was uh, he hated Meeks cut off. Huh. Which, Isn't that shot on 16 millimeter? Yeah, but who knows? Maybe he just didn't like that story. Maybe. Um, 
Or he hates women. Uh, I mean, uh, I, Tarantino definitely doesn't hate women, but he's got weird hang-ups. He's definitely got weird hang-ups. Um, he's just someone I can't really predict what he's going to like anymore. Yeah. Which is, like, kind of why I like him still, you yeah. know? <laughs> like, I didn't know he had fucking Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in him. Yeah. I never thought he would have made a movie like that, you know? So here's the thing. I think we all have to come together, and no matter what he does for his 10th movie, we have to give it bad reviews. <laughs> Because he, he will not feel comfortable going out on that movie. And we just got to see how long we can do it until he stops making movies. <laughs> got to keep maybe. Him into trying to put a good cap on his career. Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe that's the, the plan. <laughs> oh, I kind of like that. Um, I don't know, because then the, the flip side of that, maybe he'll be like, see, see, this is why you gotta, I only got to make 10 movies. I'm willing to take that risk. Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Because if it's good, we can all just lie about yeah. it. Yeah. So here's some. So this is uh, another weird thing about this is that it's got Brian Cranston in it, in such a minor role, really. Like, there's oh, it's a supporting role. It's a supporting role, but it's like there is nothing showy about it at all. You know. Yeah. It's like this isn't a role he would have agreed to like a year from after this came out. This is like the middle of Breaking Bad. He can only play big characters after this. Yeah, he played fucking Trumbo. Yeah, I mean, he's in the bathtub, right, on the script? Yeah. He, he played LBJ in that TV movie. Oh, wait, what? Well, he was, it, it was a Broadway play, and then he played him in a movie version of it. Ah. So, All the Way, which is about LBJ's re-election campaign, hmm. um, which is pretty good, honestly, but it also is the movie about like how he breaks the Democratic Party on the uh, civil rights issue. <laughs> Because he endorsed it, and then, you know, that splits the party for the next election. Well, but. what's Brian Cranston been up to? He was in Godzilla, and I thought we he also, was great I in that. I forget that Brian Cranston is like 66 years old. He's a lot older than you would think in a lot of ways. Yeah, he, he looks great for his age. I think, yeah. he's, I think it's he's, the he's up there. thing from Breaking Bad. Like, it just, <laughs> oh, that just makes you look younger. Mm. But um, I think it's what he's got so much money, but I do think he is trying to get that Oscar in some way. Like, I think he wants an Oscar. Yeah. I could write an Oscar for him. Yeah. He's in he Asteroid City. He's going to be in Wes Anderson's movie. Oh, okay. You know what? He was in uh, uh, Isle of Dogs, which is my least favorite Wes Anderson oh, yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was... Um, but, like, stuff works in that, and his voice acting is very good in that. He so was, Speaking of voice acting, he was Zordon in The Power Rangers. <laughs> you are the Power Rangers. I mean, yeah. hey. <laughs> I'd... Wait, because he was in the original series, right? Was he? Was he like a duck? Did he do a voice in it? I don't, because I didn't see it. So I just know him from the movie that you're talking about. Yeah. And I, which we have a soft spot yeah, for. Yeah, he was in two episodes. He did a, he did a voice. Because that's, you know, you know, Power Rangers is made, right? Yeah, it's, it's like made in Japan. Yeah. They just have like the American people voice over it and they assemble it into like something watchable. Yeah, they, like not that it's not watchable over there, but like for American audience. But it's also they, like they three shows it. combined a lot of the time. Like, yeah, and then yeah. They, and later they started shooting original stuff for it, but mm -hmm. initially it was just like ridiculous shit. Um, it was Dr. Tim Watley on Seinfeld. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy who might have become Jewish just to make Jewish jokes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so horrible. It's so stupid. Is that the episode that ends with uh, Seinfeld's dating a girl and like it's going all right? And like the last line of that episode is that girl dropping like some horribly anti-Semitic comment. Yeah, no, no, because no, it's like he's just trying to date her. Like she's a recurring character, I think. Right? Yeah, Remember she like stuck around for yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and then he finally gets to go on a date with her. And then, um, uh, like they, he, like he says something about like how like oh man, good thing, um, like we're not those people. And then she says like oh yeah, better that than the blacks or the Jews. Yeah, and you're just, just like whoa. Face. <laughs> I remember. I think I was drinking. That was one of those like I'm drinking something while watching. And, like I just spit it out. Like yeah, <laughs> I was really caught off guard. I, like I'll, I'll never leave my mind now because of that. He was on an episode Ooh. of Babylon Five. Should I watch that? I've never seen um, it. You know what? I started rewatching it, and it kind of held up. Like, I didn't think it would, but I only okay. watched about, like, half of the first season. So, all right, all if right. you're into that, like, old sci-fi shit, um, check it out.
but um, he is also, of course, the father in Malcolm in the Middle, yes. which is a terrific show. Yeah, which is like I'm saying, it's like he's got that and Breaking Bad now. He's got like more money than God for the rest of his life now. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't have to work. He just wants to. <laughs> Breaking. Bad. Um. That was. It, yeah. It, it is crazy thing. This is in the middle of the Breaking Bad thing. Like it feels like it would have been just before Breaking Bad. But, yeah. But also, yeah, this is then, that weird period where Breaking Bad is like on the verge of cancellation constantly because no one was watching it. Well, let's see. Did they? When did they film this? Because this is two thousand three, season three, mm-hmm. pre season three. Breaking Bad was always like, is it going to come back or is it not? After season three hits Netflix before season four, it's over. It's it's just like skyrocketed to fucking. But even that, but pantheon. I remember that there was even talks that they weren't going to do season five. Really? Yeah, there was kind of like it. It's it was doing better, but like not as well as they wanted. And I think there was some talk of like. We don't know if we want to do season like I think it was a should we move season five to another network was the conversation uh. cancel it but should we move it and then it became we'll do season five but it'll be the last season and we'll split it in the two um, yeah because look here's the thing look you're what I'm looking at it it never it only cracks two million once in the entire first four seasons and that's for the premiere of season four. And then once you get to season five, it is two over two million every episode, and then part two, it's like over four million every episode. Yeah, that show was so fucking huge by the it, end. Yeah, it was wild. I mean, there will never be something like that, honestly. Like there'll be event shows. I don't think there's gonna be anything that was like Breaking Bad, like with a slow start. Yeah, and then like the audience builds up over time like that. Yeah, that's slow yeah. build. It, it's, it's hard to do that. I think it could happen, but a lot of stuff has to hit the ground running now. At, at least right now. In the next yeah. couple of years, we're carrying over from like, well, if it's not the next Stranger Things, we're going to cancel it. Yeah. Which is just a psychotic. Here's another thing. Um, I started that 90s show. I don't know how well that 70s show holds up. I have a huge soft spot for it, and I like a lot of it. Uh, a lot of people were kind of ragging on the the new 90s show because it's like well they're just a bunch of kids and stuff like that and it's it's like disney channel original like acting and i'm like uh people people really have nostalgia goggles because like those early episodes of that 70s show before the cast really comes into their own it's the same shit yeah those early no episodes one knows what they're talking of that 70s show are a mess the the and later episodes are a mess <laughs> <laughs> the final, and then the ones in the middle the ones in the middle are also a mess but um, I've ne- I, look, I've never liked that 70s show. That's fine. So, that's fine. It was one of those ones where like people would be like, watch that 70s show. And like, we'd put an episode on and I'd be like, I didn't, that was bad. And they'd be like, well, that wasn't one of the good episodes. And then it happened like six times. <laughs> and I was like, uh, maybe there aren't good episodes. Yeah. So. But I only bring that up because it's like stuff isn't allowed to grow anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, Hey man, like it's 10 episodes on Netflix. This clearly didn't cost them a lot of money. Mm-hmm. If a couple kids get a shot at acting because of it, like a lot, I, I've seen some of the shit but, you people but, praise. Yeah, you know? didn't you see the CEO of Netflix said they'd never cancel a successful show? We can take that to the bank. Did you know that seven billion people silence. watched Bright when it premiered? <laughs> you mean every person on the planet? Yes. Oh yeah, including newborn babies. Yes. That's what they just had it on loop in the hospital. That's what their their thing said. That's what the numbers said. They're not letting us see them, but that's what they're saying. We can trust that, right? It's not like the subscriber number is the only thing you can really track. They wouldn't be lying about those other numbers. I'm just going to tell people that 8 billion people watched Drive when it was on Netflix. <laughs> Ten trillion hours of drive Ten has been watched hours by me. Of drive have been watched in the past week on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> by but it's just me. Yeah. I just have it on my computer, my laptop, and my PC. We're just going over to every house in the neighborhood and starting drive on Netflix. Yeah, I mean, I was that obsessed with this movie when it came out. I was definitely one of those guys. No, yeah, I was like, no, I was. Yeah. I, I, I never got close to buying the jacket. But like, I, I almost like, bought the jacket. There was like, what you did? 
<laughs> no, I almost bought the jacket. Okay, okay. And then I was like, that's $150. <laughs> that was the thing. It's like, you're it's like, oh, I'm going to be the guy from Drive. I'm going to be the Drive. Oh, I'm broke. Like, I'm broke and I don't have a license. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I didn't have a car at that time. And so I couldn't go up to people and be like, I drive. Because then they'd be like, no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I drive. I command the room with my silent, stony presence. <laughs> it's like I just got. Just you know how I'm gonna win over women. I'm just not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna stare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that works. Yep, that'll <laughs> definitely work. Because yeah. we all look like Ryan Gosling. Oh yeah. See, no, it's, it's only okay look, when he you don't does have to it. Look like Gosling. You just gotta be like him. This totally works. Just try handing them a toothpick and they run and call the police. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get violent out of nowhere. That'll win people over. <laughs> no. But hey, hey, let's talk about the violence in this movie. Because then that also lets us talk about two of the actors we haven't discussed yet. Okay. Uh, the violence in this is is pretty horrific. Yeah. It, <laughs> it is, is one of those where like once the is... movie, it does something I really like where like it's not violent, I think, at all for the first like hour of it. Like... Yeah, like Oscar Isaac gets the sheep bit. Oh, there's the sheep. The, the sheep. shit beaten out of him. <laughs> <laughs> the shit beaten out of him, and you see like the aftermath. But you know, it's like a it's like a bruise and battered thing. There's some like blood tissues and stuff like that. And then when he gets killed, because we're talking about Drive, um, when uh, Christina Hendricks gets her gets, gets their shot, head shot off, like it is so horrific. It is it a looks moment like where like a bag like, of meat explodes. Yeah. And it's Christina Hendricks who has like three lines in this movie. Yeah. And it was um, probably also kind of at a peak with like Mad Men at the time. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Mad Men. That's fucking right. Yeah. Th- that show doesn't, that show lasts longer than Breaking Bad, right? Um, I think it had a longer season, but I think it goes off the air before. I could be wrong though. Like, I don't totally mm. know. I um, know it definitely lasts longer than seven seasons. So, but it premiered before yeah. Breaking Bad. Okay, yeah. Um, I, never finished, show, I fucking... never finished Mad Men. Go back. I didn't like it when I first started it because I was like, I, I, I needed something with like a little more rush to it, you know? Yeah. And then I go back when I'm older and I'm like, all right, still a little slow. But let me see where I, this you goes. You know, I was with it. And then they did an episode that really rubbed me the wrong way and it kind of got me like not interested in, the, in it anymore. Mm. But that's just me, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my she's, grandparents she's... fucking loved Mad Men. <laughs> so, because <laughs> I guess well, we're back fantastic. to an insane time. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. See, we used to be able to get drunk at work, and yeah. it's like, well, people still do that. We just don't talk about we just it. Don't anymore. talk about it. <laughs> yeah, everyone yeah. still does it. Um, also, apparently, everyone and their mother does cocaine, which is uh, was news to me very recently. I was like, oh, I guess. Oh, you didn't know that? No, I mean like. Not to the extent that apparently it is, just in the world around me. If, your, so if your parents were above the age of 15 at some point in the 80s, they did cocaine. Yeah. I'm no, just... It was so fucking funny. So I was talking to, like, uh, my godparents and, like, you know, they're they're pretty prim and proper people, whatever. <laughs> they, they don't really, like, talk about that stuff. I'm sure they dabbled when they were younger, like everyone else and their mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was just like, yeah, you know, I just had this revelation recently where I was like, well, that person does cocaine. That per- have you all been doing cocaine? And they were just like, "Oh yeah, yeah." My like, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> like they're like, "Oh yeah, all of our like uh, our coworkers and stuff like that." And I was just like, "What world have I been living in?" <laughs> I just woo. I my, thought it was just like a film industry thing. Now my dad had me convinced for a little bit, but like right after coming out of high school, he was like, "Yeah, I did a fucking shit ton of cocaine." <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ, man. Like, I didn't know that, but hey. Because <laughs> he, he said he Because here's the thing. I'm not even joking. Like, I'm not trying to put... I've never done any drugs other than, like, prescription stuff from the hospital, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I've done painkillers and kind of got addicted to painkillers, but, like, they just kept redoing my thing. So, like, that's the closest. I don't drink or anything. My dad was convinced I must have been doing something. And he was like, you can tell me. I was like, no, I haven't. I was like, no, nah, you know, look, I, I've done, I've smoked weed before. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I haven't. It was like, I've, I've done cocaine. I was like, well, fuck, what? Like, 
And then it was one of those where, like, suddenly he had, you know, like how when your dad tells you a story and he's like, well, my friend got into a situation. And, like, then I was like, oh, no, that was you in that story. (laughs) (laughs) That wasn't your friend. Like, my friend got high and decided they needed a Christmas tree, so they went out to the woods and cut one down, and it fell over onto a cop car. And now he's like, nope, that was me. Like, <laughs> so, my dad once, uh, he uh, ran a stop sign. Or no, he this actually, he didn't. His friend did run the stop sign and got a ticket, and they tried to challenge it in court. And the night before going to court, my dad might have gotten a little intoxicated and went out with some friends and stole the stop sign <laughs> <laughs> and then tried to argue in court that there was no stop sign there. They didn't, they well, didn't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've dabbled. Mm. I, 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 I've done some dabbling okay. before. Here's the thing. I'll just say this real quick. So I was, uh, I guess I would say sheltered when I was like in middle school and and junior high and stuff like that. And then after I start gaining a little bit of confidence in high school, I'm a lot more freedom because I'm becoming a young adult. Uh, I I just, let's just say I actually start jumping to the top of the food chain real quick Uh and uh, I burn out real quick. (laughs) So maybe that's why I got that out of my system and I don't feel the need to go to like raves and shit right now. Whereas like a lot of other people are like discovering stuff now and I'm like, yeah, go have fun. And I was like, I, I feel like I maxed out before I was 21, <laughs> which is maybe for the best. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Sometimes that is the best way to do it. It's like, yeah. if, don't, like don't do drugs. Gambling, I don't encourage you that. Lose. Like, you don't want to win the first time you go gambling. And you'll be, yeah, ch- you'll be yeah. chasing that high. <laughs> yeah, I'm also not a, a big fan of gambling. Mm. Like, that one I didn't have like to have any experiences to stop doing. I just was like, no, I, just, I, I say, money. also like I I'm losing money. <laughs> I don't gamble. I don't drink or do drugs. But I honestly think a big part of it is because I feel like if I did do it, I would be like a fucking maniac. No. Like I'm not doing it out of any altruistic <laughs> like self control. I just know if I was gambling, I would be a gambling addict. Like I just yeah, I, I know that part of my brain exists. <laughs> like you know what else? Um, I I just never had a fondness for was smoking. Yeah. Like I would I would smoke hookah, like hookah lounges sometimes, but like even that was like kind of like a year or two max. I, I smoked cigarettes in high school like casually with like mm-hmm. friends and stuff like that, because parties and shit, right? Yeah. And then like I I'll never forget, it was like I was smoking, it was like raining. I, I had bought these really expensive cigarettes, and then I was just like, Hey, this was like twenty dollars yeah. worth of stuff. <laughs> like I don't like what the fuck I could have gotten like fast food or something for this. Yeah. And then I just never smoked again. Yeah. And that was before I was even, like, 21. So that felt, like, pretty good. Yeah, I, I had friends like that. Like, they would buy drugs or something. They would tell me how much they spent. They'd be like, dude, you could have gotten, like, two Xbox games for that. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, such a fucking dweeb. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. That's what I think about now. I'm like, do I want to go out and, like, drink at a bar? Or is, does the bar have food? <laughs> like, yeah. If they have food, I'm I'm probably going to eat and maybe I'll have one drink. But even then, I'm not like drinking mm-hmm. as, nearly as much as I used to. I think I, 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 the smoking thing just didn't happen because I just associate that with a family member who I didn't like, you know? Like, yeah, I, so, I completely get that. Yeah. So it's like I, like, I just have a visceral negative reaction to smoking now. Like, and so, hey. I avoided lung cancer, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. Secondhand shit. If I get if I get fucking lung cancer from secondhand smoke, I am seeking revenge on everyone. Like, <laughs> there you go. That's an exploitation movie. Oh, he's got you lung can cancer, that. so he goes after smokers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. Directed by Nicholas Winding Ruffin. <laughs> oh my god. This. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Honestly, here's the problem with smoking, though. And this does tie back in the drive and the violent actors I wanted to mention. Mm. Or violent characters played by actors. I don't know them in real life. But, like, smoking does look very cool and very cinematic. No, it is it's a It is a repulsive thing, thing in real do, life. Yeah. Also, when I think of smoking, I think of George Costanza trying to act like he was a smoker that one time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop now. <laughs> they got all of me. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I used to think of the Kramer one when he was like drinking and smoking oh, at the same time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm cool. <laughs> and he swallows a cigarette. <laughs> Bring up Seinfeld a lot. Uh, well, because what is life but the Seinfeld episode? I feel like there would have been an episode of Seinfeld parodying Drive if Seinfeld had stayed on the air. Oh, yeah. I feel yeah, like that yeah, would have yeah. happened. Yeah, there's a couple, like, here's how you can tell what's a cultural, like, mark in society. Would Seinfeld have done an episode reference? Yeah, that? you know what? That's actually, that's the only reason mm-hmm. the English patient has any lasting thing on their culture. Yep. <laughs> You are making out during Schindler's List? (laughs) (laughs) That is maybe the most iconic thing they do on the show. Fucking Newman saw him. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Does Newman die at the end of Seinfeld? No. No, because in the the courtroom, when they get found guilty, spoilers, uh, (laughs) Newman's there and he's eating food because he's Newman. And he starts laughing, and he starts choking on the food, and he goes down. <laughs> we never, we have no follow up. Newman's dead. <laughs> I don't, is it? I think it, Newman might be dead. <laughs> I'll have to ask Jerry Seinfeld. I'm, I'm going to email him because I totally have his email. Vargas. That's what his name was. I was trying to remember what the bizarro Newman was, and it was Vargas. <laughs> Well, okay. Here, here's the, the the violent characters in this. This is related are, because um, we are bringing up a comedy icon. Yes, are uh, Bernie Rose played by Albert Brooks and Nino Izzy Palazzi played by Ron Perlman. Um, these are some of the greatest like low level villains of the last decade. These are fascinating characters. Yeah. Um, we I, haven't even talked about the driver like fully yet, but the, I want to talk about these guys because they're. Well, it, fascinating it is also just like, the insane thing of like everyone was so sure albert brooks was gonna win like it was just like it was a guarantee at that point you know they and, are they are terrific in these roles yeah and then just doesn't happen you know the other one that year was everyone thought uh pat nozzle was going to get nominated for young adult oh yeah that was a big discussion that. at that time yeah and nothing happened <laughs> No. That movie I don't think got Nothing anything, else. and I like that movie. I do too. Hard to watch. Um, yeah. Uh, shame. Uh, yeah, Ron Perlman, I'll just get him out of the way because he's the least interesting of the two very interesting villains. Um, but he's he's the firecracker. He's the guy who's doing, speaking of coke, like he's the guy <laughs> doing coke all the time. And he's like, that's some badass shit, motherfucker. Yeah, he and stuff like, like that. that a lot. Yeah, and it's like that could totally just go overboard so easily. Uh, but you have Ron Perlman. Someone once called Ron Perlman America's caveman. <laughs> I heard that once. And I'm like, that kind of works. That's why this driver's got to go, Bernie. He's got to go. He's got to go. Um, but he's also, yeah, I think it's because he was in Quest for Fire, the caveman movie from the 80s. Quest for Fire. I don't think I've one. seen that one. No. It's like, there's like no, uh, I don't think there's any dialogue really in it. Like, it's just cavemen. Mm. What's the one movie where he's like a monkey man? Is that like what? Island of Dr. Moreau? Ron Perlman? Yeah. That might be Moreau. He's, I know he's in that, but... Um, that I've actually... seen a clip of him like defending people as like a monkey man mutant. So that seems like a it, I mean, what else Dr. Could Moreau it be? thing. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he's in City of Lost Children, oh, which I was just hyping up earlier. In, um, in Island of Dr. Moreau. Is, is that a monkey? I think that guy's a monkey. But he's definitely right. an animal person. Yeah, that's probably the clip I saw on sci-fi. Right, he's a, no, he's a blind goat hybrid. Never mind. All right. Then I don't know what the fuck I'm talking oh, about. Oh, Sayer, I get it. Um, but, yeah, he's the Sayer of the law. You know, the law says whatever the fuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's a weird movie. Yeah, no complicated feelings there about no, that one. Nothing at all. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, he's fucking great. And he's got this whole like ego thing where he's trying to like hit the big time with the, the big Italian mob. And wh- what does he say? He's like, ah, oh, they still pinch my cheek. Like I'm some fucking kid. Yeah. And it's like, you he, know, like that, that, that must be like a, a bruise to an ego. Is he supposed to be like half Jewish? 
I think he's half Jewish. I think I think Bernie Rose but, says he's half Jewish. Well, no, because he, he mentions a comment about like how the mobsters on the East Coast like call him. You know, I can't say the word, but oh yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but you know, Ron Perlman is very much. He's not Jewish, right? <laughs> like, am I wrong? Oh, he's, I, I, oh, I don't know. I gotta check that actually. Yeah. Oh, he's of Polish Jewish descent. All right, my bad. I, sw- I was like, "There's no way Ron Perlman's Jewish." <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, Perlman?" And then it sure showed you. Yeah, he's a very vocal critic of former President Donald Trump. <laughs> All right, there you go. Yeah, um, and he's in every fucking Guillermo del Toro movie. <laughs> yeah, for like two seconds. <laughs> No, no, he's in uh, he's in Nightmare Alley for like the first yeah, he's, half, he's in and a, then a, a little bit later. Nightmare Alley. He yeah, was a then. failed awards contender. Yeah, uh, Pinocchio. Pinocchio uh, as the the Podesta. Mm-hmm. God, that fucking movie. So, so, uh, sorry, I I don't want to talk about how much I love that movie, but it's, it was so fucking good. good. This um, is, just in general, this is like a stacked <laughs> cast of a movie, though. But, yeah, but yeah. I think we all agree it's Albert Brooks who's like. The, the steals best the whole this. fucking show. And it, I forgot yeah. he's actually in it like very little. Like he really is a yeah. supporting actor, but every scene he's in is memorable. And I guess it was just the thing of like he, you know, he's never really played a role like this. You know, uh, mm-hmm. he's he's a comedy guy, and you know his last name's actually Einstein. Oh no, I did not That's, know that. He had to change it. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have been Albert Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> that's not even a joke that's like true so he changed it to brooks because his brother which i didn't know for the longest time was uh bob einstein super dave from oh i thought you were gonna say mel no no because <laughs> it's mel brooks ha, ha, ha. Uh, but no but i'm saying because of the real last name bob einstein he was super dave and marty funkhauser on curb your enthusiasm mm. recently passed passed like two years ago right think so it was like right before the pandemic hit and i remember hmm. uh, but there was a guy that guy was fucking so funny but have you seen what is your history with albert brooks you know apart from finding nemo this might be the only movie i'd seen him in up to that point really truthfully yeah really yeah let me let me take a look at his filmography maybe there's some stuff that pops up that i just missed like, he was like a big, he was like a letter, like he was on like the Tonight Show, like he would do bits for the Tonight Show and he did like SNL stuff. Like he wrote, like he used to do the early version of like what now are like the SNL digital shorts, you know? Mm-hmm. He used to do like on the street stuff for SNL back in the day. So yeah. Oh, you know what? Uh, the Simpsons movie. Oh yeah, he's the villain. Which is, I mean, he he's is fucking fantastic. He he's plays, in the Simpsons. Period. Yeah, he played uh, what's his fuck, uh, Hank Scorpio. Um, yeah, he has like seven Simpsons characters. Yeah, uh, which is like that's one of the like defining Simpsons episodes is uh, mm-hmm. Scorpio. <laughs> yeah, and I still stand by the Simpsons movie being like crazy underappreciated. I like that movie a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you, oh, you know what? I'm full of shit. Uh, he he's an out of sight. He's a um, uh, taxi driver. Taxi driver. Yeah, I don't think I'd seen it up to that point yeah. though. Taxi driver. He's in the Twilight Zone movie. Yeah, it's just, uh, check out that retrospective. You hadn't seen broadcast news. <laughs> I had not seen broadcast news up to that. Which point. is like a perfect little movie. Yeah. Um, he's terrific. And that breakdown when he's on TV, man. I mean, that is the funniest fucking shit. Of just I like I'm like that is one of those like that scene will kill me every time I watch it basically, mm. but um, but he also had a, he had a career as a writer and director, um, making such films. You ever see Real Life? No, Real no, Life's not. terrific. Um, it's kind of like uh, it's a parody of reality television before reality television even really existed. Oh, yeah. Well, I gotta watch it. It's it's really really funny. Um, the trailer for it is amazing. If you haven't seen it, I recommend anyone watch the trailer where it's like, I'm Albert Brooks and I'm here to talk to you about my film real life. And this trailer will be brought to you in 3d. And then it's like 3d, not available in this theater. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's him like doing stupid 3d gags, but like nothing, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Like, 
Uh, Modern Romance. You ever seen Modern Romance? I have not. Jesus, man. Lost in America. Yeah, yeah I have seen Lost in America. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a very funny movie. Kind of, And he's kind of the first guy to be like, uh, baby boomers suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's kind of the first guy to do that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I can't think of anyone really before him. Um, Defending Your Life. You ever see Defending Your Life? I have not. It'd be a real shame if a show called The Good Place ripped that movie off. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh. But uh, it's a good, that's a, a fun movie. It's him and Meryl Streep. They've like both died and they're like in heaven. And basically like there's a like you can, you know, it's kind of like you can ascend to another level of existence if you use your life well. But if you wasted your life, you don't get to ascend and you have to go back and you have to do life over again. And it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah, it sounds good. I liked there's, The Good Place. <laughs> there's, the, there's a really fucking good scene in it um, where he has to defend his life. Like, there's a court case for him to defend that he didn't waste his life. <laughs> and it's him with his wife. And it's like, I'm going to ask for a promotion. Like, they're going to give me a promotion. He's like, they're going to ask me for $15,000, but I want $30,000. And he's like, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to say $30,000. And they're going to offer him something that's going to keep saying it until they give it to me. And then it goes like, so he's like, see, yeah, look, I plan to stand up for myself. He's like, yeah, but let's see what really happened. <laughs> and he sits down and they're like, uh, we can offer you $15,000. I'll take it. <laughs> 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 and the guy is like surprised he did it so quickly. <laughs> um, really good stuff. Uh, in a movie called Mew- The Muse. Have you ever seen The Muse? Which I think is the last movie he did. No, uh, no, 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 I'm not that, seeing it. So I got a whole Albert Brooks filmography. You really should. Like, that, uh, totally worth it. That is the one where he's like a writer in Hollywood. I think I've told this joke for the movie on it, but he gets a meeting with Spielberg. Like, he's on the rough, but, like, he wants, he got a meeting with Spielberg, and he goes up, and he has to walk up, like, all these hills to get to the Amblin offices, and he gets, he's in the waiting room, and then it's like, okay, you can go see Spielberg now, and he goes in, and it's, it's Stephen Wright, and... He's like, hey, how's it going? They talk. He's like, well, when, when, when's Spielberg going to be here? And he's like, oh, Steve, I haven't seen him in like a few years. And it's like, well, who are you? He's like, I'm Stan Spielberg. I'm his brother. Like, oh, Steve just has me take these meetings. I don't know why. Like, <laughs> Martin Scorsese's in that movie. Oh, shit. The, the joke of that movie is Sharon Stone is in it. And she is, she claims to be a muse, like an actual muse from like Greek mythology. <laughs> and she's in Hollywood and like all, like all these big Hollywood Titans come to her for inspiration. Right. Mm-hmm. And oh Brooks, yeah. Yeah. You have brought this up. Yeah. Before. Now yeah. Brooks lets her like live on the property to like, so hopefully she'll give him some inspiration. And all I remember is Martin Scorsese being like, yeah, yeah, we're going to, we're going to redo raging bull, but with all little people. Like, and he's like, you sure that's a good idea? He's like, yeah, it's the best idea I've had in years. <laughs> like, <laughs> some good shit. That movie's fun. No. Um, um, but, yeah, he's he's amazing in this movie. Yeah. You he's, really he's should. You absolutely should. amazing. And it's a, totally against what he has done his whole career. Like, he's, I can't, you know, there's not many other movies that he's done like this. Yeah. I mean, what the last things he did, oh, he, the last thing he did was the fucking Louis C.K. movie. Oh, yeah. God, he's yeah. a voice in The Secret Life of Pets, and then he does Finding Dory right before that. Yeah. I mean, he's old. He's an older guy now. Like, Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not expecting to pump out There like, was kind projects. of a hope that Drive would give him this, like, second wind, and he does, like, This is 40, which no one remembers that movie. I remember yeah. it. I don't like it, but I remember it. <laughs> And then he like he does a most violent year. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is kind of like an, a drive adjacent type role, you know. Yeah, Oscar yeah. Isaac's also in it with Jessica Chastain, who is not in this. He's in Concussion, and then like yeah, and then he oh, just yeah. hasn't done much. Like I think he's just too old at this point. Like I think yeah, he's probably comfortable. He's he, seventy five. He was one of the like... first guys to get on Twitter. Like oh, was he? Yeah, he like did Twitter back, and they used to like. Because I think he had a book coming out and he used to promote it, and it was funny shit. I actually I went and I found some of his old tweets from around the time Drive came out. Let me see if I can. Cause they were they were pretty pretty funny stuff. Um, 
No one liked him, apparently, though. Show some respect for Albert Brooks. Boo! Well, here's, oh, well, this is the casual one I just thought was funny. He's like, congrats to Nicholas Reffin. His movie Drive, of which I'm a part, won him Best Director at Cannes. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Well, here, I have one. I'm on his Twitter page right now. The last thing he tweeted, January 24th, just reached for toilet paper and found three classified documents. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That sounds about right. He has been doing a lot of, like, anti-Trump stuff in the last year. Oh, so Drive is is leftist propaganda. Yes, of course. Couldn't you tell? Uh, But here's a... This is from... This afternoon at 2, I'm going to beat up someone from The Help to promote Drive. (laughs) just came back from a morning showing of drive to make it like 3d i stabbed six people in the theater (laughs) oh my god he he was like the original poster yeah he he was one of those guys like he did like the original (laughs) stuff i'm not sure like how much how much of it's aged very well but he was it was one of those where when i went to look him up it was before quote tweets really existed so like it's oh, that yeah, yeah, weird yeah. where like your tweet combined with the other person's tweet. Remember that yeah. era of Twitter? Yeah, yeah. You you had like RT in between your tweet yeah. and the tweet you were quoting. It was that was a weird time. Yeah. And this is from when the uh La La Land thing happened. It said, because of tonight's horrible Oscar mistake, I have retained a lawyer to see if I won for drive. <laughs> oh <laughs> even he fucking knew he deserved that yeah. shit. God, God bless you, Albert Brooks. Yeah. Also, his his Twitter bio, I just want to read it. <laughs> Filmmaker, actor, author Albert Brooks. Originally joined Twitter to promote my book. Now trapped. Can't get out. Help. <laughs> and then an Amazon link <laughs> that's to his book. Funny. That's, pr- that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Oh, no. Funny. Albert, there's a 404 error to, to your link to your book. Oh, Albert. Albert, no. Albert, no. I bought his book. I have it. I should buy that uh, book. I don't know. It's I, I read it when it came out, which was like the year Drive came out. And <laughs> it's kind of like it's a satirical kind of book about like what he thinks the year 2030 will be like. Mm-hmm. And it's this weird like it's it's kind of a weird book of its era where like it's actually a very optimistic look. But it's like it's one of those uh, things will be things will essentially be better, but everyone will still be miserable. <laughs> like, that was kind of the angle he took. <laughs> um well here it, he's not miserable in this movie no nope. he's just a very cold businessman it, he is kind of a, a prick he is kind of a miserable prick he's mean to fucking brian cranston oh yeah well everyone's mean to brian cranston except for the driver yeah which is sad he, he, yeah because like honestly brian cranston is using him like yeah yeah he, yeah like he does care but he is using him mm-hmm. and like he, he does like like he fucks up that relationship like right before oh, he dies yeah yeah Man, does, it's still sad. He does everything wrong you could do, basically. Yeah, it's just it's so sad because he's so desperate for like a win, mm-hmm. and he just he just doesn't get it. That is know? what is really cool about this movie is that like the first hour is this plot about him like going to work as a race car driver for Albert Brooks. Yeah, and then it never goes anywhere. Like it's just like oh, and now it's a crime movie all of a sudden. Like. Yeah, yeah. That's, like, uh, what does Nino say? He's like, you paid 300 fucking grand for this piece of shit. Yeah. And he's like, ah, I well, paid Albert's 300. trying to be a good cop there. He's like, it's not. It's about what's on the inside, right, Shannon? Like, yeah. Which is like his kind of like subtle way of being like, it's better be fucking good. Like, mm-hmm. that's, but that's also oh. when he gives the... is Now that's... Yeah, that's when he gives the monologue where he's like, did they ever tell you about how me and Shannon met? Like, mm-hmm. his little monologue where he's like, he used to produce movies in the 80s action flicks sexy stuff one critic even called them european i thought they were shit like <laughs> it's my favorite monologue in the movie like he gets a couple good ones yeah. i don't know that's that's a great one though um it's like i, I really i, I had the... shannon around i liked him even though we overcharged the shit of me like <laughs> well that's uh good stuff. i i love the one that makes it into the trailer where he's like, ah, oh, Shannon goes, kid, I want you to meet Mr. Bernie Rose. Oh, yeah. and he's like, ah, oh, nice to meet you. The driver's like, oh, my, my hands are a little dirty. So are mine. Like, oh, my God. Like, that's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> it's sleazy crime movie dialogue. Like, Yeah. Also, do you oh, my God. That, like, so much great. of this movie is about, like, male posturing. 
Mm-hmm. Like, and the, but the driver does none of that. Like, he's not posturing at all. Like, yeah, he's he, he is who he is, but he also still has to like transform. Well, he mm-hmm. he does posturing, but not in the way they're doing it. He's not yeah. doing it out of like a sense of ego. He's doing it because he he wants to he wants this relationship with his neighbor Carrie Mulligan mm-hmm. to work out. But I also think it's just a like he's fucked up. Like honestly, like that's what it is. Like because <laughs> he's there's a part in the elevator where he fucking crushes a dude's whole head. Yeah, and it's partly him like def- like protecting her in a way, but it's also him like being like I have to I'm gonna I'm gonna kiss her now because she's about to see who I really am in a minute. Yeah, like, and it's like he's just like really like he's got this bottled rage of some kind, but. Also, like a ch- like he's kind of childlike too. Like he gravitates towards that kid, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and remember, it's like I like it when he's sitting with the kid watching the show. He's like, "How do you know he's a bad guy?" He's like, "Cause he's a shark." He's like, "What? There's no good sharks." Which is like that's like the only time he's really like diffused in any capacity. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a very romantic movie even though you just just described like one of the most horrific scenes in the movie well that's where it trips you it's like it's kind of like it's kind of a romance for the first half and then it just turns into like schlock violence for the last half and i say that in a good way like i'm not it's not a complaint at all yeah you know mandy does something similar Mm -hmm. you know um very different movies obviously uh but like the the first half like it has to be about mandy because the the structure of that revenge narrative when mandy is killed which it's it's in the trailer you know it's coming yeah um but like if that doesn't work then it's just like oh you're making this an exploitation movie Mm -hmm. which is like fine you can make it's like i mean maybe it is still kind of that uh not that it's trying to rise above it but it's going for something like almost metaphysical in that movie yeah and i I find it fascinating, like you, ref- you referenced uh, Refn, haha, <laughs> reference Refn, that he's like taking elements from this exploitation stuff that he really loves, and like readapting it and like uh, addressing it to like new material now. And I think there's just like this this oncoming wave of artists that are trying to do that. It's like here's all this problematic shit that we really love, yeah. but like how do we like explore it in like a modern context? Like you you can't just have like horrific violence done to women in movies anymore thankfully yeah, like that's repulsive like, be... and it, it hasn't like mm-hmm. aged well obviously well that's when you get um, like this weird like kind of like edgelord type filmmaking for a little bit you know like yeah um, yeah 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 there, not, there was a lot of stuff like from this era cut. that like felt of a piece like drive was kind of adjacent to it but like a lot of that stuff hasn't aged as well you know um, mm-hmm. i remember a lot of like vi- very violent films which I like now when I look back, I'm like, what were you even going for, motherfucker? But <laughs> yeah, there's, I don't know. Um, I, I I like I almost feel I I want the term elevated schlock to become something. Like, <laughs> no, no more elevated. I, anything. I know elevated horror is like such a bad term, but I do kind of believe there's like an elevated schlock. Like there's something to it, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think it works because schlock. It's still schlock, but it's also like good schlock, you know. No. But hey. Um, this is also a film that, I mean, it's very clearly like a uh, neo noir. It's like, yeah. um, I'm getting into like film noir around this time for the first time, like Chinatown. I think I even watched it around this time for the first time. Um, Terriers on FX, which if people follow me on Tumblr back in the day and on Twitter now, you will know that I've been banging that drum since that show first aired in 2010. Um, got one season had no audience <laughs> but was very good and um i think very ahead of its time in terms of like balancing the episodic and serialized nature of uh like modern television like i i really think it's like a comparison to like breaking bad and like boardwalk empire now, but aesthetically very similar to drive like their films very similarly i don't know what cameras they use on terriers, um, and also to to nail the uh, the noir aspect, Ryan Johnson did an episode of Terriers, mm-hmm. and it's it's like I think he even does the the brick thing when checking the clock with like the time, yeah, and like the weird uh, uh, meetup logo and stuff like that. Like, so it's a whole thing. Everyone track down Terriers if you can. It's it's a good show. Now I was gonna ask, were you getting into neo noir at this time, or were you getting into neon noir? <laughs> Maybe neon. Because, like, neon noir. suddenly becomes the thing for, like, the next, like, five years. Uh, yeah, and people are still kind of... There's almost a kinda... joke about it being, like, 
if it has neon in it, film Twitter will love it, you know? Yeah, when yeah. does that and end? I, when does that stop? Where now it's like it's embarrassing to have neon in your movie. Uh, I think the pandemic ended it. No, I think it ended a little before that. You sure? Yeah. Like it was a joke, but I think people were still doing it. You yeah. know? Yeah. But like, I'm trying to think of when people started like really turning on that look. Maybe I'll say 2018, 2019. Then mm. after Blade Runner, there you go. After 2049. Yeah, it might have been Blade Runner. Like yeah. that might have been it because people don't like that movie. Uh, well, people are full of shit because I remember the raves when that came out. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. You don't have to like that movie, but you're wrong. <laughs> um, like, I, I don't know. There, there's this era where I'm also, uh, you know, speaking of the difference between like neo noir, neon noir, and um, actual film noir, like the black and white stuff. This is when I'm like going on YouTube and like, let me look up old movies. And yeah. then I watch Nosferatu and I'm like, holy fuck. But that was also, you know? that was also the era where you could type in a like 70s movie and find it on YouTube. Like, yeah. just Nosferatu. Yeah. So I think that's how yeah. I watched The Driver, the Walter Hill movie. Oh, nice. Which, uh, you know, this is, this is a big, like, I had seen, you know, I'd seen The Warriors and like 48 Hours in Southern Comfort. But this is like, Drive kind of gets me to go back to Walter Hill and like really watch his movies, you know, mm -hmm. I probably watched streets of fire for the first time around this time. Um, I, I came to it later. Yeah, I definitely came to it later, but, um, probably for the best, because if I saw streets of fire at the same time I watched drive, I'd be like, what the fuck is this now? <laughs> you know, uh, did you, uh, watch the movie, uh, the samurai in the wake of drive? Uh, no, I didn't see that until like, years later. that was a movie that like in a ton of writing i saw for drive that movie was brought up a ton as being an influence right that makes sense and yeah that was once where i was like okay i guess i'm watching this and i watched and i'm like oh this is the best movie ever <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> one of those you know and it's like oh now i'm into french movies and i don't realize <laughs> the french new wave is like completely different than that shit but like yeah you know, i'm watching I get I get in the in the John Pierre Melville at the time who had like a really good run for a while. Yeah. Oh my God, he does Army of Shadows yeah. and list the Red Circle after that. That's fucking. Army wild. of Shadows was like really difficult to get for a while. I didn't see that till later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, but, same here. Uh, uh, Roger Deakins' favorite movie. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That awesome. Yeah, makes yeah. Sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, but like, the summer is a masterpiece. I feel like people have gotten a little cold on it. Um, but I, I think we'll go back to it when Michael Mann comes out with his new movie, his Ferrari movie. Maybe. Cause like, I, I think we we're missing that vibe for movies and like Michael Mann brings a very specific vibe. I'm not saying this is a negative, like it'll, it'll come back. The wave will come back because it will start talking about Michael Mann again. And we'll start talking about his influences, his cold noir aspects. And you know, Jean-Pierre Melville, um, that's like, it's clearly Michael Mann's guy, too. Yeah, he's you know. definitely a big influence. Uh, do you know what happened during the first meeting between Ryan Gosling and Nicholas Winding Refn? No. For this movie. So, uh, producer Mark e, Mark e. Platt? I don't know who this guy is. Mm -hmm. um, he kind of pissed it to Ryan Gosling. And then Gosling uh, was like, all right, who do you... Or he asked Gosling, who do you want for the director? And he was like, holy shit, no one's ever asked me who I want as a director for this project. Um, holy, I, th This is clearly a new era of my career. Like, uh, you know what? I really like this Nicholas Winning Refn guy. Let's, let's, let's try to get him. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. Refn read the script and he was, uh, he was less interested in the crime aspects and he was more interested in like the concept of this man sure, has like this weird personality, <laughs> yeah. like inner turmoil thing. Right. And so they, <laughs> they go out to dinner and it is, they compared it to like a, a awkward, bad first date, <laughs> like just a miserable experience. They could not click, you know, when you're trying to talk to someone, maybe you're both even like on good terms, but sometimes it's just like, I, I cannot get the gears are not clicking. Stuff's not happening right now. And uh, Refn doesn't drive, so Gosling's like, yeah, I'll drive you home to, to your uh, your place for while you're in L.A. And then when they're driving, that's when everything starts clicking. And I guess they drove around for, like, allegedly, like, hours mm -hmm. from, from one place I read. 
and they're just talking and then they're like all right we can do this movie cool that's a cool that's like cool story yeah it's like a mystical <laughs> happening in hollywood maybe it's not true but i really really love that you know <laughs> you know though you mentioned mark platt and i'm like that name sounds familiar and i decided to look him up he is the father of ben platt and oh! the producer of Dear Evan Hansen. Oh. And also, like, looking at his last, like, few years of movies, he's basically my cinematic nemesis. Like, he's doing the Wicked movies. He's doing oh. the Mark Webb Snow White. He's doing the Rob Marshall Little Mermaid. He did Babylon. Um, Dear Evan Hansen, Cruella. Something called Thunder Force. Oh, the, uh... Melissa McCarthy superhero movie that no one remembers. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Not tri- very good. The Trial of the Chicago 7. <laughs> Aladdin, Mary Poppins Returns. And yeah, like, it's like that, his, his career. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we'll always have Drive. Yeah. He, it looks like he had a more interesting early part of his career. He did like this. He did like the Legally Blonde movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. So he's got great, some stuff. Great. Kevin Smith's oh. uh, cop out. <laughs> oh well, I don't like that movie, but I don't hate it. Yeah, I don't hate it either. But um, it's also like, yeah. it's kind of just like there, you know. Yeah. But he's yeah. all here's weird. He's producing the Wicked, uh, two parter, but he's also producing that wonderful Wizard of Oz movie that's going to get made apparently. Hmm. What What's that hmm. about? I'm not going to read into that. Uh, he remaking... also produced... Oh, that's a different thing. I thought they were remaking Seconds for some reason. It's the the different... John Frankenheimer yeah. movie? I was like, what the <laughs> Why fuck? Would... And then I was like, oh, it's a different Seconds. Okay, right. okay. Yeah, you, you can't really uh, recapture that energy. No, um, you cannot. Yeah, check out that movie, everyone. Yeah. Uh, but he also produced Ryan Gosling's feature director debut, Lost River. Oh, yeah. You know what? I never saw it. I admire it more than I could recommend it. Yeah, I think it's going to be one you, of those. You can totally see, like, Gosling's, like, a, an interesting actor now. Like, I think that's safe to say. Um, he clearly took a lot of inspiration from the directors he worked with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, I think Reffin even produced it, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe that I'm wrong. That would make some sense. Uh, I'm wrong. But, <laughs> he, um, like, he brings over Christina Hendricks from Drive. Mm-hmm. And um, he's working with, like, Benoit Deby, who's, like... Ryan Gosling, we just got, he is fucking... such an odd kind of presence as an actor, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, he seems to really kind of limit what projects he does. And he seems like he's he's never really been like the box office name. I think people kind of expected him to be, you know. Yeah, no. Like no. he's because Blade Runner flopped, Nice Guys flopped, First Man flopped. Like those are all movies that really like put him front and center in the like he's in this movie. Mm-hmm. And it's Gangster Squad. <laughs> Gangster Squad. Oh um, my god. But yeah. like he has this, and it was I don't know. He's got such. He does the the gray man is like the weirdest anomaly of his career, frankly. Yeah, like, that's such an anonymous thing for him to do. I know, I know. Those Russos must just be good in the room. They they know the the producer buzzwords yeah, to say, like yeah. you know, and maybe they probably maybe they have a vision like that would be good. They just can't achieve it. Yeah, maybe. Like everyone's got or, a vision. Doesn't mean you can uh, get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, Gosling is, I, I like him. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, He's in the he, it's weird that he had, like, this this pretty boy, like, reputation. Yeah. Where it's like, he, he's picked very interesting I think he roles. Maybe, like, we're talking about his bombs, yeah. but, like, he's, he's an interesting guy. I think he maybe, like, wise. was resistant to his pretty boy reputation, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, he could have done like seven more movies like The Notebook after The Notebook. Yeah. Didn't do that, you know? Mm-hmm. Just like Fracture and like Ma- Lars and the Real Girl, you know? Oh, yeah. I remember that movie. Which Holy is the movie shit. that gets made because he got fired off The Lovely Bones. Oh, my God. Do you remember, you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, cause he put on all this weight to play the father in the lovely bones and then like three days in the filming they fired him and so he's like well i gotta do something with this and then he does he just does lars and the real girl jesus 
which uh when did the lovely bones come out that came out like 2009 then right yeah i think so um, <laughs> that's two years after lars and the real girl wow. peter jackson what happened my guy i've heard peter jackson like just is like he cannot not make giant movies now like mm. so cause that's a that's a you know that's the thing where like famously that script was like really low-key and kind of like impressionistic and like he turns it into this giant thing oh like, man yeah i think it's why he ends up back in hobbit world because he can't make anything but those movies now like oh I I that, that's a little sad, it is. I, I, hope a little he, sad. I, it, I hope he makes something else it happens then. to some directors you know yeah what's weird is that like i've heard that's a problem with raimi as well but raimi was able to go back with like drag me to hell like yeah he was able to go back to kind of like bootstrappy horror movie but he also like couldn't get projects made after that for a long time like he had to do Oz, mm-hmm. which is another giant movie, and then it's like almost ten years till Multiverse of Madness. Now, now he's, Christ, yeah. he is remaking Magic. That's what he's attached to right now, though, right? So, oh, is he? That was oh, what, shit. The last thing that was announced was that he's going to remake the movie Magic, uh, which is a really interesting movie. Oh, that just got announced like last week. Oh shit! Okay, I, didn't I thought know that. it was announced a while ago. <laughs> Um, oh wait, no, it was. But there, I guess there was an update. Okay. Sam Raimi is gearing up to direct the remake as of last week. Okay. So okay, so it's like a lie. I thought the update was about to be Sam Raimi off the remake of Magic. No, because that did happen a lot yeah. last decade. Yeah, he had a lot of those where like he was about to do it and then it didn't happen. Yeah, didn't he almost make Hurricane Heist? He did. <laughs> he almost did an American remake of A Prophet. You remember that? I did not know that. Yeah, he was what? That very briefly. And that was one of those, like, that. I think that just doesn't exist anymore, really, of the American remake of a foreign movie. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, it yeah. used to happen a lot more, and now it just doesn't happen that often. Mm-hmm. When was the last time it happened? Let me in. No, I don't know. <laughs> Remember, like, our, HBO bought the rights to do something with Parasite, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it wasn't going to be a remake. It was going to be, like, I a, think, a, just a show that took place in that world or whatever. I, I think it was going to be a remake. And then Parasite kind of became this juggernaut. And then they're like, well, now we can't remake it. Oh, I see. I think that's what happened. Remember when Parasite got re-released in black and white? I haven't seen that. And Bong Joon-ho was just like... I don't know. That would be fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like, I, I, I like movies in black and white. I thought it'd be cool to see Parasite in black and white. Like that was his answer. Like, why'd you do this? Like, I don't know. That'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even try to be like, actually I intended it to be black and white. It was like, nah, that would be fun. I want to see Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley in black and white. Cause that one at least is like, okay, film noir. That does kind of um, feel like it should have been black and white. Yeah, his, his like lighting with Dan Lauston mm-hmm. uh, feels like very uh, like contrasty, so that like lends itself to black and white. Um, oh, but for for the record, the last couple of remakes that have been remade in English, uh, Ambulance. Oh yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, Ambulance. That uh, makes sense because that's the guilty. Like, what was that? The guilty. I don't know what that is actually. Uh, it's it's a remake of a movie called The Guilty. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, also starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Wild. Yeah, what, what's, he, what's he got going on? Jake Gyllenhaal's a weird guy. Yeah. Um, I like him, acting-wise. I don't, I don't know his life. Oh, A Man Called Otto. Oh, yeah, but it, I thought that was just a book. No, 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 it's also a Swedish-language film called A Man Called Ove. <laughs> That's how you say it, Ove. Well, who directed that fucking shit? The the man called Ove no, or man, man called, called Otto? Otto. Mark, N- not a man Forster. called Ove. The guy who did I like World Mark War Z. Holy shit! Uh, technically, <laughs> I don't know if he counts anymore I know, for making that like, one. Uh, yeah, yeah, he is listed on it. Um, he also did Christopher Robin, which I like hey, actually. A man called Otto quietly made seventy two million dollars. It's fucking wild. Do you know anyone that saw that movie? No, but it's Tom Hanks in I, January. I guess, that sounds like man. something people would see. I guess. I mean, yeah, all the Avatar deniers. I'm going to become an auto denier. <laughs> I don't know anyone who saw this movie. <laughs> yeah, that's one's um, Avatar one's just a lie at this point. Like, 
Yeah, it's like, no, it's either they're lying about not knowing anyone who saw the movie. Or they or have they're no just friends. Saying, yeah, they don't have friends. <laughs> Which is fine if you want to openly dunk on yourself, yeah. you know? You fool. Yeah. Um, Drive, we should start wrapping it up. Yeah. Um, uh, my favorite scene uh, in this movie is uh, when shit's like hit the fan and uh, Ron Perlman goes to Albert Brooks in his restaurant. And they're like, we got to do something about this. And it's like, we got to clean this up. If any of this gets back to us, we're in trouble. Like, we're both dead if, if we, they feel like we stole from the East Coast mob. And they're like, driver's got to go. And then Albert Brooks quietly, like, motions that uh, this guy here that we got, he was part of it. We got to d- deal with him. And Ron Perlman's, like, quietly, like, yeah. So to make sure that this thing goes away quietly and cleanly, Albert Brooks stabs a fork in the guy's eye. <laughs> And then cuts his throat open and blood spills everywhere all over the restaurant floor. I would have taken him out back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just saying. like, I get the sense their business front, the pizzeria, isn't doing very well either. Yeah, didn't, so they're not too worried well, about is that. Is it a pizzeria? What is I that? think so. Because folks, he's eating, uh, he's eating Chinese food in there in the beginning. Isn't he? Is he? Oh, he might be. Yeah. The guy, but he, the but... guy forgets to bring him chopsticks, and he's all like, "That's oh, right." Well, he 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 orders takeout. That's okay, why. so yeah, so maybe there's you yeah, know, maybe yeah, they're yeah. at like a strip mall. Maybe the guy he won't even eat the food in his own restaurant. But like, mm-hmm. he went down the street to get Chinese food, and the guy forgot the chopsticks. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, they have a party like that night at the fucking place. Yeah. <laughs> I would not uh, do anything in that restaurant for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. After a murder. Yeah. Oh, and I, I know it's like a funny scene that it's like, we'll take care of it quietly. Yeah. And then, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> but like, that is also like, even though Albert Brooks is like the cool, calm, collected one, he's still like angry and he's still like, motherfucker, this is what I have to fucking yeah. deal with. Now you have to fucking well, deal yeah, with it. Yeah, I mean, he is making, like the scene, he's making a point where he's like, not yeah, but it is fucking funny. Me. But it is like yeah. one of those, like, I would have at least taken him somewhere. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> they could, you could make this point any number of places. Yeah. Or maybe just not do the fork in the eye thing. Also, I feel like the knife to the throat. He's really trusting it. that that place is doing no business because it's like broad daylight. And that guy's sitting next to the window. Like they must get no traffic. Like, see, this is the difference between a good movie and a bad movie, in my opinion. A good movie, I have zero problem with this. A bad movie, I'm like, well, obviously they're a fucking stupid no, exactly. person like, behind this. A bad movie, you notice this like the first time you see it, right? It took me like seven watches before I'm like, wait a minute, like. But, like, I just, I lo- also, it's just funny when, like, Albert Brooks later, he's, like, again, he's supposed to be the more, like, cool and collected guy. So, like, when he, he cuts uh, Shannon's wrist, which is, like, such a dark scene. Uh, yeah. He's, like, it's over. It's over. Like, nothing you can do. There's no pain. Like, and, uh, like, that's a fucked up scene. But, like, he's supposed to be, like, see, he's more methodical about it. He's not vicious. And, like, a scene earlier, he's, like, stabbing that dude in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ron Perlman. Yeah. Got injured, I think, during during his death scene. Oh, really? There's some story where, like, I think he fucked up his like leg or something because the waves like hit him in a weird way. Um, which is another shot that is like just like a film nerd's like fucking wet dream of yeah. just him on the beach with that lighthouse in the distance. Oh like, my! It's this movie is so essential to the DNA of film Twitter. <laughs> like, I don't know if film Twitter is the same without this movie. For you know, better or no, worse. This is film Twitter. It began <laughs> with Drive 2011. Like, for... So blame blame that, like... No, no, no. Don't blame it. It's perfect. Well, here's the thing. We can all blame it, but we all... No one's come around and been like, eh, it's actually a bad movie. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, has anyone done that? No. And if they have, they're a liar, mm-hmm. frankly. Like, the only account I follow that gave Drive a negative review is that old shitposting account that was a shark that reviewed movies. Oh, pff, I don't know what that is. It was it was just shark, and every review would be like, one star, no sharks. <laughs> that was the joke. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> Wait, I think I do remember that one. Yeah, they used to, they were big. They were like big on Letterboxd back in the day. I don't think they've posted in like five years though. Oh. Yeah, yeah, they haven't posted since Concussion 2014. So Whoa. this is like decade old Letterbox, man. Yeah, I wasn't on Letterbox then yet. I got invited to the early Letterbox. Like I was like one of the people like where I was like, hey, I got an in at this new movie site. Like you had to be invited. And oh. I set up an account and then I barely used it for like years. <laughs> so wasn't that gl- glamorous. No. The shark count uh, gave I... Jaws five stars. Naturally. Tragic drama. Shark destroyed by own humor hubris. Master. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of production notes before we wrap up. Uh, do you know that Hugh Jackman almost did this movie I with did. Neil Marshall? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's like the first note on the Wikipedia. Yeah. But here's some other stuff that people might not know. The character of Blanche, played by Christina Hendricks, um, Nicholas Winding Refn tried out a bunch of porn actresses because he wanted that vibe for the character. <laughs> and then he was like, I didn't really find anyone with like uh, the quality of of acting i, I kind of needed for that role wow and i'm not saying he's full of shit i'm not saying that was a genius choice all i'm saying is as great as Katrina hendrix is i don't really know um if she in particular brought anything to that character that someone else couldn't have people keep trying to do the thing where it's like i'm gonna legitimize porn actors like that seems to be a recurring thing in film history yeah. Which, like, I'm not against, but it, like, never really seems to work. Mm-hmm. The work, I, I think, was uh, Boogie Nights. That counts. So some of the older people in it were actual, like, Nina Hartley's in that. Like, mm-hmm. she's Little Bill's wife. She's an actual porn actress. Well, you know, we're also, we're always talking about, like, the shifting of the industries and <laughs> stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, Sasha Gray, uh, maybe at one point the most popular porn actress in the world last decade or two, right? right? Um, or whenever she started, and uh, now she's on Twitch, and that's how she makes most of her income, I believe. And she's a photographer, and so like that, she she's in charge of her own like yeah. income, basically. Last thing is that the internet she's out of the industry. In it, there's a, you know there's good and bad that comes with everything, but it has kind of democratized like the sex industry, you know. Yeah, you don't need yeah. like these weird. And of course, the internet cracks down hard on sex workers all the fucking time. I so know. It's such I a know. fucking nightmare and just awful and i hate it but um hey that's where all the real free speech battles are happening by the way it's always pornography like mm-hmm. it's never some fucking dope on a podcast it's they're the ones that get attacked all the time all right i'm gonna go on Pornhub right now and look up the actresses who could have played the role of blanche let's not do that i, I won't do that no um oh albert brooks also was really drawn to the character of bernie rose because he was like why the fuck would you pick me to play this yeah. part? Like, that, it doesn't make any sense, but that's why he was interested. And it's like, yeah, that's why you're so fucking good in the role and should have won an Oscar for yeah, it, frankly. Should have at least been nominated is the thing. Like, that's that's really it. Like, he, it's offensive he wasn't nominated. Yeah. Wow. But I guess maybe, like, Film District, they were a new company. Maybe they just didn't have that sort of infrastructure in place. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and it really is like a political game to get stuff yeah. there. Wow, which is why it's only lasted four years. That's insane. Like, oh. I forgot it was that quick. Ouch. Because there was a while where it was like they were kind of a mark of quality in a weird way, you know? Like, mm-hmm. film district, see Logan, be like, oh, okay, that'll be interesting. And like, hit and miss stuff, but then it is like safety not guaranteed, and that's like a quick collapse. Like,. Oh man, they released the old boy remake. Good lord. Um, oh, okay. This is the last things I'll mention, just because uh, I I love the look of the film again. Uh, Newton Thomas Single Siegel mm. New- Newton Thomas Siegel. He is uh, a great cinematographer who's worked on the fucking. Uh, uh, he's worked on a bunch of the X Men movies. He's worked with Brian Singer a bunch, unfortunately. But like <laughs> the look of the movies are not the problem. You know, uh, he worked with Spike Lee on The Five Blood, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, he worked on Channing Tatum's feature directing debut, Dog. Of last course year. he did. That's what that movie needed. Yeah, uh, I heard it's actually pretty good. But you know why I bet you he was picked? Because he worked so- with uh, Steven Soderbergh? No. 
His first credited movie, he was a camera operator on Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising. Oh, okay. So, I bet you that's how he got in the door with Wendy Ruffin. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah. Um, yeah, terrific Also, yeah, movie, movie not even nominated about. for uh, cinematography. Like, this got zero nominations from the Academy. Yeah, which is psychotic, because it's out... I think it's outlived every movie that was nominated yeah. that year, basically. Yeah, yeah, it was. That was a bad year. We talked about it at the top, but it wasn't like a great year for the mainstream stuff. Yeah, this is the the last note I will end on. The music, obviously, everyone loves it. Everyone like like at least makes memes of it, you know, yeah. like um, with the the score by Desire and Chromatics. Uh, Johnny Jewel is kind of like the 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 guy who runs those brands. Chromatics is no longer um, a, a, a operating band They're since disbanded. <laughs> Which is unfortunate because I really like their stuff, and this movie introduced me to them. I saw Johnny Jewel the February before the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, so I could have gotten COVID there, and I didn't. Well, I saw him in person. That was like one of the last things I did, like outdoors that year. Remember when COVID was like starting to rip through society, like right before we shut down, and people were like, "Yeah, but we still got to do the the Boston Marathon or whatever the fuck." Like they were like. <laughs> I was like, we gotta start, stop, like, we're not gonna shut down, but we maybe should stop doing these big events, and like, nah, but we gotta do the big events. Yeah. I was like, man, this will be a real wake-up call for this country, and then no one learned their lesson. <laughs> yeah, well, t- to be fair, I think a lot of people were like, hey, what the fuck? And then, like, they're just hammering away, like, no, 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 it's over. Mission accomplished. Yeah. And it's like, no, yeah. actually. Go ahead and take a look at those numbers, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, again, the soundtrack... Uh, super influential on my music taste. I, like I mentioned uh, in the middle of the episode, I maybe dabbled in certain substances. So certain like electronic EDM type stuff got a lot of play in my iPod back in the day. This was kind of like a, like a way for me to like further explore stuff that's maybe a little more low key, but still um, very influential for my, my current taste of stuff like the, that retro synth pop yeah. stuff. That uh, a lot of people are really drawn to now. Yeah, it's the lamest. It's, um, it's like such a cornball thing to be attracted to, but it is kind of my taste as well. Right? Yeah, no, it, it's it's so fucking. I, I hate to say this word because of connotations, but like it's cringe. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but, but also, it is me. Yeah. So I'm embracing my inner cringe. <laughs> but it's like you know, like I grew up in carpenter movies. I like synth stuff. Like, yeah, it's just that's where I go. It's where I bring. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned. Um, now this will be the last thing you mentioned that this movie was like kind of one of the ones that showed you like, oh, like anyone can make a movie, right? Why is synth so popular? Uh, not because of actual popularity, I would argue, but because it's also like the first genre of music outside of like classical that's like an individual could compose an orchestra yeah. basically with that. Yeah. Like Carpenter's whole thing was like, I don't know, it's cheap and fast and I can do it myself. And everyone's like, this is the future. <laughs> and it's like, well, kind of, but like, you know, it's, it's a good starting point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's it's a good place to to try some stuff out. That's all. Uh, drive, five stars. Five stars. Check it out if you haven't. You've seen. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you if you haven't seen it and you're listening to this podcast, congratulations. You're the one. Yeah, you're the one person on earth who hasn't seen Drive. Yeah, that would be wild if someone who listened to this podcast hasn't seen Drive. Honestly, if you are, please respond. Like, I I just don't believe that exists. Yeah, <laughs> I really I really don't. Like, everyone's seen Drive. At least most people. Everyone. Also, it's weird that this is, like, a movie that, for a movie that was, like, dominant on, it felt like, streaming back in the day, the only places available without paying for it is Tubi. Huh. Like, that's weird. Is Tubi the future? No. (laughs) Tubi exists. All right, Matt. Um, I'm going to do the, the quick little uh, uh, roundup thing to see what we're going to talk about next week. Yes. So I, I got the numbers in. Roll those I'm dice. Pressing, I, I'm, I'm pressing the search. Big money. Uh, well, it depends on your, your definition of big money. Because we're talking about Mank. Mank. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it. Oh, talk Mank it up. <laughs> Will we have enough to talk about? Will we love it? Will we hate it? I don't know. Tune in next time on the Failed Award Contender Season 2. Matt, thanks for joining me again. Do uh, you want to do plugs or you want me to just guide people to the description again? Go fuck yourselves. 
All right. <laughs> Links to all of our stuff down below. Like and subscribe if you like this episode. If you didn't like this episode, uh, like and subscribe anyways, because you might find something you do like, or you can just go watch Drive again. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We have been professionally unprofessional. Booyah. Mm-hmm.